Hey guys, today is uh, August the, I mean, I'm sorry, November, <laughs> November the, what is it today though? The 17th. 17th, Tuesday. We're going to continue on with aerosol and humidity. Um, half of the class yesterday, uh, you see half the class passed the exam, half didn't. Um, be sure to come on time, be live or be in the classroom. Uh, that's the best way to learn this material is being here or live online. Uh, if you're getting too comfortable with just looking at the videos and some of you are failing because of it. All right, it's too much information to just be lax with it. You've got to be here. This is school, be, either be on campus or be online. The recordings is if you so happen to couldn't be online at that time, something happened and you were sick or had to work or then you look at the recording, but just to say, I'm gonna watch the recording every day, you're not gonna make it like that, all right? Hopefully when this vaccine come through, uh, we get back on campus because this is not working uh, for a lot of students and there's nothing else that we can do about it. All right, <clears throat> so we're gonna continue on with the lesson plan. All right, pick up where we left off at yesterday. All right, humidifiers and nebulizers. All right, so humidifiers, you have humidifiers and you have nebulizers, okay? Um, sometimes they overlap in what they do for, for you, uh, but they're still different, okay? Humidity you cannot see Aerosol, you can see. Uh, but we have some different types of humidifiers uh, that will allow us to deliver humidified air to a patient to do uh, the things we talked about yesterday to keep them from happening, right? Those domino effects that we talked about yesterday that can happen from a lack of humidification. And we talked about how aerosol is also good because it not only helps humidify those dry airways, but it also helps us deliver medication, okay? So we talked about, we started getting specifically about aerosols and how aerosols are delivered. We talked about uh, penetration and deposition. Penetration is how far that aerosol particle can fly into the system and deposition is where it lands, okay? Where it deposits. And then we said there are some factors that, um, determine how far it penetrates or deposits. Okay, we talked about gravity, we talked about inertial impaction, we talked about the particle size, uh, as well as temperature, okay? Uh, because temperature talks about the stability of an aerosol. An aerosol is more stable at a warmer temperature. It can hold, the gas can hold the moisture at a warmer temperature, okay? As the temperature decreases though, the potential to hold moisture goes down. And so that water will also fall from the gas, which is called rain out, all right? And so we talked about that as well as it pertains to relative humidity and what that means. We said that aerosols or the uh, alveolar gas has 100% relative humidity because at 37 degrees Celsius, a gas has the uh, potential to hold 44 milligrams per liter of water vapor. All right, and it is holding 44 milligrams of water vapor. So that's 44 over 44 uh, times 100 gives us 100% relative humidity, also known as completely saturated. All right, if the airway or the nose who does this for the body, the nose and the uh, oral pharyngeal space, if they don't do the job, then the gas will start to take moisture away from your trachea and your upper airway tract. That will start to dry out the mucosa, making the gel layer and the sole layer become more thick and dry. It will uh, ham hamper the ability of the cilia to beat, right? Which causes you to retain secretions, retain germs, and can set up infection or bacteria media, they call it, uh, which leads to pneumonia. Okay, and the crosses of the tissue. So humidifier and, and, and aerosol humidity is very, very important. 
then we talked about we're going to get into how once we um, loosen up the secretions right we have to be careful about how much we give we have to be careful of who we give humidity to so you need to make sure you go back and understand who what patients would benefit and what patients must you watch out for when adding more water vapor to the system okay uh, also when people who have dried up secretions what happens if you put humidity on those sometimes they can swell and if they have a very weak cough and cannot protect their airway then they may plug off and possibly could be fatal right so let's talk about humidifiers and nebulizers today humidifiers of uh, the factors that influencing the relative humidity of a humidifier is surface area exposure okay so surface area exposure means pretty much the size of the bubble okay the size of the bubble of water matters all right the time of contact also matters in a humidifier how long does that gas have contact with the water okay if you just have a little bit of water and it just passes through the water really quickly then it doesn't pick up a whole lot of moisture but if there's a lot of water in the system then the bubble the uh, gas bubble has to travel through a larger reservoir of water then by the time it gets out of the water it has picked up uh, the maximum capacity of water vapor and carries it along as humidity uh, when you think about this think about standing on the mississippi river uh, and you feel the wind go across the Mississippi River. When it hits you, it's moist because it picked up moisture from the water, all right? That type of humidifier would be called a Passover, a Passover humidifier, okay? When the, water, the air passes over a body of water and picks up the moisture, all right? That's a Passover type. The bubble type is the one we're talking about right now, and that is what we use on our low flow device, all right, the bubble humidifier is a low flow device humidifier only for the nasal cannula. All right, we use that one for the nasal cannula. And so surface area matters. How big is the bubble humidifier? Time of contact, how, how big is the bubble, right? How, how, how deep is the water of the bubble humidifier? And finally, the temperature, the temperature. So the factors that influence relative humidity of a a humidifier is surface area exposure, time of contact, and temperature. For instance, this is a bubble humidifier. This is a bubble humidifier, okay? The nasal cannula goes on here. You stick your nasal cannula on here and it goes to the patient, all right? I have my nasal cannula in here today, all right? But this screws up to the flow meter. You screw this on to the flow meter Turn it on two liters, three liters, four liters, up to about six, because that's what a nasal cannula goes to, right? And you put your nasal cannula on here and it goes to the patient. And now for some reason, this is yellow. Some of them they make them yellow, but this is for oxygen only, it's not for air, okay? There's no reason to get humidified air in your nasal cannula, there's no reason for it, okay? So I don't know why they make it yellow, that's stupid, but they do. So this goes to oxygen and this is it now. What happens is the oxygen travels through here and then goes under here. You see those little striations right there? Those little lines, those are actually holes on the inside. And so what happens is the oxygen goes through here and comes up and bubbles. The bubbles go up through the water and then out to you, okay? So the bigger this is, the more uh, relative humidity you can have. Okay, this happens to be a smaller one. So as the bubbles go up through the water, and it's kind of empty, it's usually full, but as the bubbles go up through the water, they pick up moisture, okay? The more time of contact, just like your nose, the more time the air has to contact with the inside of your nose, the more humid it'll be when it gets to your lungs. Same thing here, time of contact. We're trying to make the bubble touch the water as long as possible before it comes out, the gas comes out to the patient. This is a bubble humidifier, also known as a bubble diffuser. Sometimes they call it a bubble diffuser. Now this is a smaller one. Now, this is also a bubble diffuser, but look at the difference. Which one's gonna have a better humidity? The larger one, because it has longer time of contact. 
So as the water travels through both of these, it's the the uh, the uh, air or the oxygen that comes up from the bottom. It's got all this travel, picking up, picking up, picking up, picking up, then finally come to you. Or well, something like this, it only can pick up, pick up, pick up, and it come to you. So the bigger the uh, aerosol, I mean, the bigger the container or reservoir, the more time it has to contact with the water, and it's going to pick up more humidity. Okay, common sense. This one's going to be bigger because of the time of contact. All right. So the three factors are bubble size. How big is the water bubble, right? That air bubble that's coming up through the water. Uh, time of contact and surface air exposure. All right. Surface air exposure. Just like the nose almost. Almost just like the nose. Told you the nose is the most uh, amazing part of the body. Everything starts with the nose. Okay, nothing, none of the gas can do any work until it comes through the nose. And the nose does so many different things. So don't forget, not only does it humidify and it uh, moist, moistens and heats the air, but it also protects, right? It protects by having those hairs that catch those particles that, before they get to the uh, mucociliary escalator or the mucus blanket. Before they get there, they catch some of that stuff, those uh, hairs in your nose, that's what they're for. So protection. Um, heating it up and humidifying. Wonderful, wonderful nose. Now, what are the types of the humidifiers? Let's talk about them. Uh, we just talked about this one. Everybody look at this one. Bubble diffuser, a bubble type. That's what I just showed you, okay? What I just showed you. The gas is forced. This is considered the straw part. This part will be the straw. Gas is forced through the straw under the water, okay? The smaller bubbles, I mean, the smaller the bubbles, the greater the relative humidity. The more, uh, uh, more surface area are, let me see, it should be area, more surface uh, area. More surface area for gas to come into contact with the water, okay? Uh, the deeper the water, the greater the relative humidity. So uh, if I'm using this one or this one, this one's going to have a greater relative humidity because the water is deeper. You have more time for that bubble to travel through the water. The longer it's touching the water, the more uh, moisture it's picking up. Okay? Any questions? Understand that part? Okay. All right. The greater the temperature, the greater the temperature, the greater the relative humidity, right? Uh, in here. The greater the temperature, the greater the relative humidity in these, okay, what they can produce provide. Uh, <clears throat> used with the nasal cannula to provide or uh, prevent dry gas from being delivered. Most common in hospitals. That's what you see the most is this bubble diffuser because most of your patients are going to be on a nasal cannula, right? And uh, two, three liters, four liters, something like that. And they usually have a hook to a bubble diffuser or bubble type humidifier because medical gas is very what? Very dry, okay? And so even though the nose does that, but if you're pumping dry gas on it all day, it's going gonna, it's gonna to play out, okay? It's not going to be able to keep up with the demand. So we put a little water on it. A lot of patients say, oh, my nose is so dry. It's cracking. It's bleeding. Uh, the boogers are real dry inside there, right? And so we put a little water on it, and that usually fix the problem, okay? Put a little humidity on it. All right, so that's the bubble diffuser. Now, let's look at the Passover. I just said that the Passover is just like what? The Mississippi River. If you're standing by some night, it had to be because the Mississippi River is kind of nasty. But if you're standing by the ocean, right? You're standing on a beach at night or whatever. If you've ever been to the beach, you've been to service, you've probably been to many beaches. Uh, but if you're standing on the beach and a nice cool breeze comes across the water and hits you, you can feel the moisture in it, the humidity in it. Can't see it, but you can feel it. That's humidity. Okay, it's passing over a body of water and picking up on the other side. So this will be an example of a Passover humidifier. This is the Passover. Now this is uh, two types. You can be either a Passover or Cascade. And I'm going to show you what the difference is. Okay, this is a Passover humidifier. Okay, water is inside of this container. Okay, it's just a regular container. Notice it has a plate on the bottom. I can use it with heat or without heat, okay? If I have a Passover humidifier on the heat, it is now called a cascade humidifier, 
If it's not on heat, it's just simply a Passover, okay? This is a Passover humidifier. If I put it on a hot plate and start heating the water up, it is now called a cascade humidifier. It's called a cascade. It used to be uh, they had a tower on the top, okay? And so you had to pass over. Without the tower, is that just a Passover? But if I put the heating tower on top, which had little wicks down in it and heat the water up, then it was called a cascade. But we don't use those anymore. But if you see a test question that says the Passover with the tower on it is now called a cascade, okay? Now we heat from the bottom instead of the top, all right? Now we heat from the bottom instead of the top, okay? Now, this is a cascade humidifier. Now, how does the water get in here? The water is fed in through a feed apparatus, right? And it's got this, it goes into a little bag. Where's my bag? See this bag here? What does this sign say? Not for what? Not for IV. This is not an IV bag. This is for, what's that say? Inhalation only. All right. So I would have my, my water bag. One at a time, I would just open it up. Pull it out of the bag. Now, usually I take this sticker that's on here, sticker, and slap it on my bag. Okay, just so everybody knows, this is not for IV. This is for inhalation, okay? This is for inhalation. I will take this off like that, take my needle part here, stick it in there like that, and feed in water. See the water? I'm squeezing the bag, but it would hang on the ventilator or whatever device you're using, and it would just constantly produce water all right it will keep keep on giving water as it sits on a heating plate okay usually when we put putting the water in it uh it's usually on a heating plate but sometimes it might not be okay just regular, it's just a passover it'll just be picking up the regular water right but if it's on a heat it's going to have a better opportunity to hold more water right it's going to have a higher potential because of the heat right and so if i have room air going through here It'll pick up a little moisture, but if I heat this to 37 degrees, now it's going to have the potential to pick up and hold a lot more, right? And so um, this is how it's being fed. It's a feed apparatus. It makes you know, it's called a feed apparatus, okay? So that will be on the test. And it just constantly just pours water in there. Just to a certain amount, and it kind of holds up a little bit. And it will just constantly feed into your Passover or your Cascade humidifier. You have large bore tubing on one side and large bore tubing on the other side because it's a high flow humidifier. The only low flow humidifier is the bubble humidifier. Okay? Make sure you write that down. The only low flow humidifier is the bubble humidifier, which is this little one, right? This one or the short one. These are the bubble humidifiers for the nasal cannula, and they are the only low flow humidifier. The rest of the humidifiers are all for high flow systems. All for high flow systems. So let me get my scissors right quick. All right. All right, so this is my large board tool. I'm just gonna cut this so you, for for a uh, demonstration. There's no certain amount in there. All right, so one will come from the machine or the ventilator, whatever you're producing your gas. One end will go on here like that, coming from the machine, and the other end will go on this side, coming to who? The patient. Just go to your aerosol trait collar or whatever it is you have, right? Uh, if you have a direct trach or ET tube or just a mask or whatever is being used, all right? As this, now this is a Passover without the heat, but if it was only heat, it would be generating more uh, gas, more moisture, right? And so as the gas travels from the machine into the humidifier, it will pick up that moisture 
from the water and then come up this way back to my patient. Okay, that's how they get their humidity and their heat. Okay, especially if they have a bypass airway, you wanna provide humidity and heat to that airway. And so this will be a way that you do it. Okay, passing over, okay. Don't forget the difference between Passover and Cascade. All right. All right, so the Passover <clears throat> humidifier. Gas passes across the surface of the water. Water evaporates into the gas, increasing the humidity of the gas. It can be heated. All right, now it says cascade humidifier with the tower removed. That's what they're saying. The Passover is a cascade humidifier with the tower removed, all right? But you need to understand that we do not use the tower anymore. We heat from the bottom, okay? But they're still test on that, so you need to know this. Okay, they're still testing on that part, okay? Cascade humid, the, uh, the Passover is a cascade humidifier with the towel removed. That's what a Passover is, okay? Even though we don't use the tower anymore, we heat from the what? From the bottom of a little hot plate. It sits on a little heater, okay? Uh, and that's, so when it's on heat, it's called a cascade. When it's not on heat, it's a Passover, okay? All right, so I'm gonna put right here, Passover, no heat. Cascade will be with the heat. Okay. Two common types of the Passover. We have the wick type and the membrane type. The wick type and the membrane type are two types that they still test over, okay? The wick type and the membrane type. The wick type is simply a, uh, Passover humidifier to have two sticks that go down in it, okay? Like a wick from a candle. There's a wick down inside of it with paper on it, some type of paper material. And as it sits in the water, the paper kind of soaks up the water. You know, if you stick a piece of tissue down in some water, it's gonna soak it up, right? Well, it soaks up like a paper towel. It soaks up that water, right, into the two sticks, the two wicks. And as the gas passes across it, it picks up the moisture from the wicks. Right, that's one type of Passover, right, which would be the wick type. And the other one would be a membrane type. And that's simply one with a little thin paper membrane across the water, okay? And as the water, uh, as the membrane soaks up that water, the gas passes over that and picks up the water from the membrane, all right? This has upgraded to a plastic type, okay? Uh, this doesn't have a wick or a membrane in it, but these are the ones that you will see. Okay, this is still a Passover humidifier. If it's on heat, it's a cascade, okay? You won't see the wicks stepping down in there. That's paper. They don't do that no more, okay? The membrane or the wicks, you don't even see anymore, all right? But they still test on it, okay? That's why it's important to be live and understand when you're in class. <clears throat> you need to know that, all right? Those are two common types of the Passover, all right? The wick and the membrane type, okay? The next one is, okay, we already talked about the bubble diffuser. The next one is the jet humidifier. The jet humidifier uses the Bernoulli principle to draw up gas through a tube. Actually produces an aerosol. Oh, okay, so the jet humidifier is also just like the, uh, the nebulizer, the high flow nebulizers that we use, uh, like this one here. Okay, the jet nebulizer will be the same thing as the same one we use for the high flow aerosol, high flow uh, T piece, high flow face mask, right? Aerosol, I mean, aerosol face mask, aerosol T piece. We use the jet principle, which is the Bernoulli. This is Bernoulli right here. The straw, yes. This is Bernoulli right here. The straw. Okay, so a jet humidifier will produce, actually produce aerosol, okay? The jet humidifier will produce an aerosol that you can see because it's so strong. 
It uses a Bernoulli principle right here. It draws the gas up through a tube, right? Draws the gas up through a tube, actually produces an aerosol that is baffled out to produce humidity. Most commonly, I mean, not usually heated. Remember I told you some hospitals heat it, sometimes they don't, all right? But most commonly they don't because of infection, all right? So most commonly this is not heated, but it could be, depending on what hospital you're at, all right? Uh, and it's uncommon as a straight up uh, humidifier. Just using it for a humidifier is uncommon, okay? That's a jet humidifier. So it looks a little different than that, but it's the same principle, it uses that Bernoulli principle, okay? Humidifiers continue. Now let's look at some heated humidifiers. What's the heated kind? Cascade, cascade types, okay, the cascade types, all right? Now, the cascade types <clears throat> that are on their own, like separate than straight up cascades, use a grid network to spread a thin layer of water through which the gas passes before delivery to the patient. Gas travels down through a tube. Gas travels down a tower, I'm sorry, down that tower. Remember I told you the cascade used to have a tower on top. Okay, it was a Passover, but you hooked and locked in a heavy tower that heated up the water and plugged up to the wall, okay? That was a cascade. We don't use that type anymore, all right? But that's how it was made. Uh, um, you have a, a gas travels down a tower uh, through a one-way valve, through a grid to produce a froth, right? A froth, but like, what is that? If you're in the hospital and see something frothy now, you don't want that, breathe that in. They don't do that anymore. Small bubbles increase the relative humidity. Water is heated to increase the relative humidity. And on the cascade types, relative humidity equals 100% at body temperature, okay? So if relative humidity is 100% at body temperature, then how much how much water is it saying that it's producing? 100%, 44 milligrams, okay? Because at body temperature, gas can hold how much? And it's holding how much? So it's 100% saturated. So they're saying that a cascade type humidifier, which will be a Passover with under heat, once I put heat on here, guys, it becomes a cascade humidifier. And at a cascade humidifier, they say they can equal 100% relative humidity at body temperature. So we can heat that up to 37 degrees, right? That's what we hook it up to. Whenever you're doing your charting, it's gonna ask you what's the temperature on the humidifier. And it's gonna have a little digital reading. It's gonna tell you it's 36, 37, 31. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's saying it's just not the person. Yeah, it's the person. This is trying to do the job of the nose. Yeah. So if we heat this up to 37 degrees, it can produce 100% relative humidity for body temperature, right? So we want to mimic. What we're trying to do is mimic the nose. So we don't want to put, we don't want it to be 80 degrees. We don't want it to be 50 degrees. We want to try to make it exactly 37 degrees and moist, okay? To do what the job of the, the body is doing. That's what we're trying to trick uh, um, the body into thinking that we're using the nose. Okay, and so they, they're boasting that cascade type humidifiers, which are heated Passovers, right, can produce 100% relative humidity at body temperature. Gas must be heated warm enough to be at body temperature when it reaches the patient. Hey, okay? that's what they're saying. By the time it reaches the patient, it needs to be 37 degrees, so it'll go in and do its job. Everything's fine. If it's not 37 degrees when it reaches the patient, then what's created? Mm -mm. There's a word I'm looking for. If the if that temperature of that gas is less than 37 when it reaches the patient, what is created there? What is that word called? There's something there that's created. Huh? No. No. The humidity inside of that tube when it reaches the patient, if it's not where it should be by the time it reaches me, then what is created between the two? And out. No. Mm -mm. What's the term? What's the term? If the humidity outside or coming to me is not the same as my lungs. The 
There's something created there. <clears throat> when, there's, when the humidity that's supposed to be coming to me mm -hmm. is less than what it should be when it gets to me. Mm -hmm. So it's less than what's in my lungs. There's something created right there that my body has to make up. So we want that gas to be 37 when it reaches the patient. So we want the humidity to be, relative humidity to be 100%. If it's not, when it reaches me, there's something created that my body has to make up. Are you talking about it's dry? It's not necessarily dry. It's just not the same as my lungs. What's that term called? There's a, there's a term there about that, about the difference in the two. What's that term called? I'm looking at these words and he's studying that what, what we already know went over. There's a term that my body has to overcome this because there is something created between the two humidities. The humidity coming into my body is not the same as the humidity already in my body. So my body has to make this up. Has to overcome deficit. it. Deficit. Humidity deficit. Oh. Humidity deficit. Yeah, you got to look at your words and your, your reading and your lecture every night. Humidity deficit. So that's why they said we want that to be at least, uh, where are we at? We want to be at least 100% relative humidity by the time it reaches the patient. If it doesn't, then there's a humidity deficit created because the, the uh, humidity outside of the body is less than the humidity inside of the body. The difference between the two is the humidity deficit. So if I ask you or tell you that the humidity is 22 milligrams of water uh, or the absolute humidity is 22 milligrams of water, in the atmosphere gas and 44 in the lungs, then what's the deficit? How much deficit do you have? If it's 22 in the room and it's 44 in your lungs, what's the deficit that has to occur? What is that deficit? 22. 22. You, the inner Humidity in your body minus the humidity outside. That's the deficit. There's a subtraction there. That's called the deficit. There's a 22 milligram of water deficit that the body has to try to make up because it has to be 44 when it goes in the lungs. So now if you're giving me 22, my body got to add 22 to make it 44. Okay, so that's a deficit. So we want to try not to create a deficit. We want to get a 44 from the get-go, right? So here come 44, so my body doesn't have to work at all to make it up to 44. It's already 44. So we're trying to use devices that will deliver this, right? Relative humidity of 100% uh, at body temperature. That's what we're trying to deliver your patient, right? Now, the function of the parts. Uh, don't worry about these parts because, like I said, we don't even use these. All right. The wick types, wick types. Now this was the cascade types, right? When you heat it up uh, <clears throat> with that tower on top, right? Remember I said the Passover with the tower on top is called a cascade. That's what they're going to test you on. The wick types, uh, it says a heater at or near body temperature surrounds absorbent paper which soaks up water from the bottom of the humidifier, right? It's two wicks two little wicks that stick down in some water and those paper towel like wicks will suck up and soak up the water. And then the gas passes the warm wet paper and the water is evaporated, right? Just takes the moisture from the wet paper towel, okay? Water level is maintained by a feed apparatus, just like I showed you here, this bag of water, uh, same way, except they would have some little wicks in it, okay? At body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius can deliver 44 milligrams of humidity. So that's good, you know, we're trying to pick the one that's going to give us the best relative humidity, right, for body temperature. All right, so that's the wick type. Two little wicks stick down in here, right? If this was a wick type, it would be a Passover like this, but you have two wicks 
that stick down into the water that are heated. They have paper on them. The paper sticks down into the water and soaks up the water. The gas passes past the two little wicks, picks up the moisture, takes it to the patient. That's the wick type, okay? If you don't have the wick type, you have the membrane type, which is the same thing, except it's a little paper membrane at the bottom that sits on top of the water. The membrane will step paper will suck up the moisture from the water, and as the gas passes over, it picks up the moisture from the paper. All right, these are older type uh, humidifiers. Okay, so that's the wick type with the two little wick stems that go down in there. All right, here's the membrane type. The membrane type is a hydrophobic membrane separates the water from the gas stream okay as the water is heated it evaporates and the vapor passes through the membrane into the gas stream at body temperature yada 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 it can deliver 44 milligrams of humidity which is 100 percent relative humidity all right water level is maintained how a feed apparatus okay so this is they just showing you there are different types of cascades Okay, but the only cascade we use now is this one. It just sits on a heating plate, heats the water up, and it picks up the, the moisture and the water from here. Okay, just like that. It's much more simple than the wicks, much more simple than that membrane, right? They, they probably um, are more prone to disease or bacteria because it's paper and all of that. So they don't use those anymore, okay? But they're still testing on them. When they stop testing, we take it off. Just like you used to couldn't use a calculator. Three, three terms ago, you could not use a calculator. Even when I was in school, you couldn't. All through till three terms ago, you could not ever use a calculator for the board exam. So Concord didn't let you use calculators for the class. You had to work everything out by hand because when you get to the board exam, you gotta work it out by hand. So why let you do calculator all through your respiratory career and you're gonna sit for the board and you got to do it by hand and you don't know how to move a decimal two places to the left for, for percent. See what I'm saying? And so if you don't know that, you're going to be like, you're going to fail, right? Uh, and because those are little things you don't forgot, right? But when you had to use your hands here, then you forgot that and you learned, went back and learned it, looked at YouTube or whatever you needed to get that skill back to make you, oh, okay, that's how I do it. And then you do it. And then by the time you take the board exam, you know how to work all that out by hand, you're good, okay? But the board said, we're going to start letting y'all use calculators three times ago for the board exam. So Concord said, okay, well, you can use calculators here. Why do it by hand here if they're gonna let you use the calculator there? All right, so things change like that, all right? Uh, and so whenever they, like they took off the IPPB, which is at the end of your term, they stopped testing on that. So we took it out of the curriculum, all right? So things like that, but this is still in there. This is still in there. All right, now, what's the next type of humidifier? Oh, hold on, we got humidifiers, A is humidifiers. You got the heated humidifiers, which are the cascade type, wick type, membrane type, okay? Then you also have the heat and moisture exchanger. This is a really cool device here. This is called the heat and moisture, what? There we go. Heat and moisture exchanger, also known as the artificial what? Nose. This is a passive, not passover. This is a passive humidifier, which means it, it doesn't take any work to do. You don't have to put no water in, you don't have to do nothing. All you have to do is what it does is it captures, and I'm gonna show it to you, and then we're gonna take a break. When you come back from break, I'm gonna let you demonstrate it, the ones that are here with the hydrophilic um bacteria filter that's brand new. Okay, you put your filter on there, you'll breathe it. Okay, what happens is when I exhale through here, okay? I'm gonna exit, the patient will, the circuit, will, it will be hooked up to the patient circuit, okay? All right, and it will be close to the patient, all right? And so what happens is when they exhale, their heat, because you know you're gonna exhale heat and moisture from your lungs. When you go outside and it's cold, you see smoke, right? Mm -hmm. That's heat and moisture, that ain't smoke. That's humidity, all right? So you're blowing that humidity all day long, even when it's cold outside or not cold outside, you just can't see it until it's cold outside, okay? Uh, so when you see people talking and you see all that smoke coming out when it's cold and stuff like that, that's why I tell you to get six feet away because that's all corona, all right? <laughs> if they got corona, you can see the corona now in the wintertime. I saw somebody yesterday, I was at a red light and it was cold outside 
and they were talking to each other and they were just talking. You see, I thought he was smoking a cigarette. And I said, damn, is that cold outside? And it was pure enough, it was his humidity. And I said, well, that's why that's good. If you right there, blowing, breathing, all that, right in, just from talking. So imagine if they singing or shouting at a game or something like that, that's, that's out there, okay? That's why you stay six feet apart and wear your dog on mask. But what happens is when I exhale, my heat and my moisture is trapped in this little special sponge. I blow it into it, then when I inhale back through it, it gives it back to me. My same heat and moisture that I just put in here comes back to me, okay? That's a heat moisture exchanger. You give it heat and moisture, and it give it right back to you. You give it heat and moisture, it gives it right back to you. You give it heat and moisture, it gives it right back to you. And it's temporary, right? This is for somebody who's going under the knife for uh, uh, something quick, right? A little appendicitis or, or some type of little corrective surgery. You're going to have a little something, something that you're only going to be on the vent for that surgery. All right, we can use this. Now, if you're gonna be on the vent for some days, we have to use this, okay? Continuously. Mr. Seating. McCarthy. Yes. Can you unshare your screen so I can see? Okay. Okay. This is the heat and moisture exchanger called the HME. Remember I said that when I was doing those uh, terminology, I said HME, and y'all were like, what is the HME? I said, it's a heat moisture exchanger. You'll learn about it later. Heat moisture exchanger. What I do is I blow into my, my air will go into the device, okay? Blow into the device. And then when I inhale, it gives me my heat and my moisture right back. So I blow heat and moisture into here. And when I inhale, it gives it right back to me. It's an exchanger, okay? Okay. Huh? Not trapped in there. It's the same CO2. So which end goes to you? Uh, you would have this end uh, going to your device and have your tubing come in here because this is going to be close to you, okay? And when you blow out, you're blowing out through here, okay? But you won't have to know what end is which. You just need to know what it is and what it does, okay? This is a heat and moisture exchanger. The CO2 and all that's not an issue. That's not nothing that you have to worry about. This is also a heat moisture exchanger. Same thing, just a different way it's made, okay? Blow into it, suck back in. It's going to give you your heat and your moisture right back. This is a temporary humidifier, okay? If you're only going to be on the vent for a couple of hours for a surgery or something like that, they will put you on this instead of wasting one of these uh, water bags and all of that because you're not going to use all of that. You're going to be off the vent by the time that's halfway done. So it's a waste. So they just use one of these. It's a one-time use, toss it. Okay, one time use, toss it. They have a little spigot here that will collect uh, secretions. If any secretions, it gets moist and starts getting secretions, it will leak down into this and they can pop that off and put the suction catheter on there and suck that stuff out of there. If you have a whole lot of secretions and gets real bad, you can't use this because then you're gonna start blocking it up, okay? If you got a whole lot of uh, <clears throat> secretions on here, it's, it's gonna just tear it up. You can't really use it. So it's all getting clogged and full of yellow secretions in that you have to toss it and get another one. Okay. So or if you they, can't use it, then what would you go to? You just get another one or you go to your cascade. Okay. Go to your cascade if you couldn't use this anymore. Okay. Okay. This is mainly a temporary humidifier. Okay. All right. Let's take a break and come back. I'm gonna go get you guys some. Uh, brand new filters that you can put your mouth on, okay? Brand new filters that block anything. Very expensive, so don't lose it. You can keep it. So when we do other things, you can keep using it because it's about $20, $30 a pop, okay? Uh, but you'll put your mouth on it, and you, I'm going to let you blow into one and suck back in, and you're going to feel the heat and the moisture come right back to you. You might not feel much moisture because of that filter, but you will feel the heat come back to you, okay? All right, I'm going to pause the recording here for a break. It is, damn, we got to watch today. It's nine o'clock. Come back at 10 after nine. <clears throat> I have a picture of a trach from the other day that I took a picture of a trach that has secretions hanging out the trach that are very, very dry because he wasn't getting the right humidity. When I came in, the water bottle was dry, it was empty, and it was, it was uh, you could see the secretions that do come out the trach on the end were crusty. That means it's dry. It's probably like that on the inside. Uh, so you have to be very, very careful. I don't know if you can see it through here. I tried to email it to myself so y'all can see it. Oh, my 
you see that? This guys is a picture of a tracheostomy that has secretions kind of hanging out of. Now this is just old secretions because secretions that come out pour out. Okay, there's a lot of secretions when it's when they have sickness and disease. Mm -hmm. But this is some a picture of some secretions. Somebody's tracheostomy in his neck, right? And this is a picture of see how dry that looks. Mm -hmm. That's dry secretions from lack of humidity. The aerosol bottle was empty when I came in. All right, so I changed the bottle and washed them, make sure he didn't have any issues. But this is what dried secretions look like, okay? <clears throat> but the secretions that you get from a patient can be overwhelming, can be like, you know, major, major secretions. I'm trying to see if I got the picture of the secretion. Yeah, yeah. This is a canister of stuff that came from somebody's tray. I don't know why you're doing that. That's what you're getting ready to do every day. My son right now. Okay. This is secretions. Look at that. This kind of, you said a Yeah. Why is it brown and red? I'm going to tell you about that in a second. Somebody's tray stuff, secretions into the suction canister. This is a prime example of bronchiectasis that you'll learn when we get to uh, COPD. Remember COPD diseases or uh, CBAE diseases? I don't know if I told you that. Yeah, I think you know that. Well, bronchiectasis is one of those we're going to know in detail when we get to uh, restrictive and obstructive diseases, which is J. Okay, hyperinflation with restrictive and restrictive and obstructive. You want to learn what all the restrictive diseases are and what all the obstructive diseases are. And COPD is a classification of obstructive diseases, right? Which has five diseases inside of those. And bronchiectasis is one of them classified uh, with three levels of sputum. You have the uh, sandy level, this bottom level here. That bottom level is a sand-like level, it's like sand almost, sand and pus. I right, just think of going to the beach and taking a handful of sand, put it in the cup, and then fill it with pus. That's what that is, right? That's one level. The second level is more secreted pus, but it's more fluid and pus. And then that top thin layer is froth, okay? There's a frothy layer at the top. There's three levels, three layers of sputum in a container like that is classic bronchiectasis. That patient has bronchiectasis, okay, which is very bad. One of the worst COPDs you can have, okay, the bronchiectasis. So this is, is It's one of the sea babe diseases. Bronchiectasis is one of the sea babe diseases. Yeah, but you, you, I didn't know sea babe was related to COPD. Yes, COPD is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. There are five diseases in that make you have COPD. You have to have two or more of these yeah, five okay, diseases yeah, and you got COPD. I, I yeah. yeah, so you got chronic bronchitis, uh, uh, bronchiectasis, yeah. emphysema, asthma, okay, and... There was another bronch in there. I don't remember what it was though. Bronchiolitis, probably bronchiolitis. All right, I think so. I look at it, but like I say, it's five of them. C baby, that's why I say you got COPD, baby, right? The C baby disease, C babe with an E at the end. All right, so that is. Oh, my two year old. My two year old. Looks just like you. I stay busy. I stay busy. Yeah, and this is my grandbaby. I got a son that's 20, 22 years old. So I'm from 22 to 2. Yeah. Yeah, I, I go in. All right. How old is your grandpa? He's like eight months now, nine months. We live in East Tennessee. All right, so that's the heat. Oh, I didn't get your thing. So let me get your. Uh, your 
I know it was, it was what did he say? He said chronic something. It's um sixty five rows. I knew that was what it was. When he said chronic, I thought it was sixty five rows. Yeah, I okay. All right, here's one. Thank you. Thank you. Nope. All right, so you put your uh, take your bacterial filter. All right, so the students are doing the HME right quick, okay? Um, when you come for lab, you'll be able to feel it. If you're online, you'll be able to feel it too when you come for lab, okay? But there's a bacteria filter we have that I give you, put your initials on it so you can keep it. So when we do different maneuvers, you can put your actual mouth on the, your filter to the machine so it keeps it clean, okay? So put your um, filter on this end, on the fat end. Only one side will fit. Put it on that end. Just like that. Now I want you to uh, take a deep breath in and blow into that, but don't let go and then suck it back in. So blow into it and then suck that right back in. You should feel the heat and the moisture come right back to you. Feel it? That's your heat and moisture that you just gave it. Okay, you blew that into this special sponge and it collected your heat and your moisture and then you inhaled it right back in. That's a temporary humidifier called an HME, heat moisture exchanger, also known as the uh, artificial, artificial nose. Artificial, the nose is a bad man. He does a lot of work, okay? That's why when it's cold outside, the, the relative humidity is what when it's cold? Well, the relative humidity stays the same, but the potential does what? Decreases. And the absolute what? Decreases. So the potential to hold moisture is low, and the amount that it's actually holding is also low. So why does your nose, what does your nose do when it's cold? Run. That's why it's running, because it's producing humidity. Right, because it's so cold outside, there is no humidity no more. So the nose has to work harder. So it'll start running a little bit to produce a moisten up that dry gas. That's why it's running. It ain't running just because you got a cold. It's running because it's cold outside and the nose is moistening up so it can anticipate that cold, dry air so it can heat it up and moisten it up before it gets to the lungs. Because the lungs don't care where you are. I want 44 and I want 37. Okay. It's just like a just like somebody you owe. They want their money and they want it on time. So whatever you gotta go out there and do, do it. You know what I'm saying? Just the filter. Just the filter. All right, so that's the heat moisture exchange. All right, let's keep going. Josh, you know you remind me of on your camera. <laughs> it was a... Uh... You remind me of the guy on um, Avatar when he's talking and doing his daily journals. Have you seen Avatar? Yeah. The soldier that does his daily journals when he's talking on Avatar. Oh, uh, nah, nah, nah. You know, you remember what I'm talking about, though, the Avatar movie? You never seen it? Oh, okay. It's a good movie. I see it. Uh, I've it seen me. it. It's a good movie. Yeah, you remind me of that guy that was doing his daily journals. Yeah. <laughs> Name yeah. Jake or something. Yeah, yeah, Jake, I think, yeah. I'm going to take that as a compliment. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. You should. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's the heat moisture exchanger. Short term with use of normal body temperature and minimal secretions. If they have a whole lot of secretions, then you don't want to use that. Okay, It's, going, it's not going to work. All right. Nebulizers. Now these are actually the nebulizers. The aerosol this, aerosol that, right? Aerosol T-piece, aerosol face tint. Right? That's the nebulizer, because the nebulizers you can what? See. Now, when you saw jet humidifier, it's the same as the jet nebulizer, just a little different, which you never even see it. So when I say jet, I'm talking about these, okay? 
the aerosol generator, large volume nebulizer with the Bernoulli principle and who at the top? Venturi. Okay, that's what we're talking about. That's the jet nebulizer, okay? Also known as the uh, large volume nebulizer. Same thing, okay? Based on the Bernoulli principle, the decreased pressure draws the water up that tube. The water sprays out, baffled into uniform size particles. Now, the baffle is a very important device. A baffle is a little uh, device that makes large particles small. Okay, what is about about what is a baffle? Small. That's what it does. It's a, an, inside of a. There's a baffle that's built inside of the jet nebulizer that you can't see, but there's a baffle built up inside of there. But the ones you can see a lot is the small volume nebulizer when you give your breathing treatment. Okay. You have, does anybody familiar with the little medicine cup of a breathing treatment? Okay, there's a little piece inside that cup, right? The little blue or whatever color it is, it's a little piece that's inside the cup that you can take out or put back in before you put the top on it, okay? That's called the baffle. That's what it does. If you don't have the baffle, it will not generate an aerosol, okay? If I don't have the baffle, it will not generate an aerosol, okay? And I'm gonna show you an example of that in a minute. So, based on the Bernoulli principle, uh, decreased pressure draws the water up the tube, right? The water sprays out baffle. That's what they mean by baffle, because it's down in uniform sized particles. And we say uniform sized particles are good because if they're too big, what happens? They do what? If the particles are too big, they will do what? Rain out. They'll rain out or they deposit early, right? <laughs> if they're too small, what do they do? go in all the way to the parenchyma, but they never deposit and they breathe, we breathe it right back out because it's just too small, right? Microns, we're talking about microns in size, all right? You want to learn that there's a therapeutic range for particles. What range do I want them particles to be in to give me the best penetration and the farthest dep deposition? Isn't that okay? one to three microns? It's uh, one to three microns, yes, sir. One to three microns is therapeutic range, but I don't think we got to that yet, but that's good. That is it. One to three microns is the therapeutic size for particles, aerosol particles. It's one to three. One to three. Now, it might say that that one gives you one to five. That don't mean it's therapeutic. Oh, okay. that's what it's saying. Yeah, okay. All right, so the jet nebulizers, uh, let's see, water sprays out about into uniform size particles. The nebulizer itself acts as the baffle. It is pneumatically powered. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Pneumatically powered. What does that mean? Does that mean it's powered by your breath? No, it's powered by gas. Oh, never mind. Something like that, but it's powered by the pressure from the oxygen cylinder. Anything that's pneumatically powered, like this right here, I don't plug this up to power or battery. It works off the gas. Once I screw it into the flow meter and turn that flow on, the gas uh, powers this device. Okay, you have some power. You have some devices that are electrical powered, battery powered, or pneumatically. Pneumatically powered means it's powered by gas pressure. Okay, all right. E allows high flow systems to deliver precise FO2. We know that already, right? The high flow systems deliver a precise FO2. It can be heated. I told you some of them are heated, some of them are not. Some of them are heated at the top. Some of them have a big sleeve that goes in the whole bottle, fits down in a little sleeve that plugs up to the wall. A lot of people don't even use that anymore. Okay. Now, what are the types of nebulizers? Well, we got the jet nebulizer, but what are the types? We got large reservoir, which will be this one. Right, this is considered a large volume or large reservoir nebulizer because it has more than how much? More than 250 milliliters of water. How many milliliters of water is this one? A thousand. So this is considered a large volume nebulizer, okay? Or a large reservoir nebulizer, right? It's for long-term nebulization, right? Long-term. And it's usually 50 to 75% relative humidity, right? So when I'm giving somebody aerosol tea piece, aerosol trade collar, I'm giving them about 50 to 75% relative humidity when they're on one of these, okay? That's what I'm giving, because it's not heated. 
right? So since it's not heated, the, the, the relative humidity, I mean, I mean, it, it can go, it remains the same, but it's not heated, so it's not going to be high at all, okay, period. Uh, they both are low, all right? Uh, <clears throat> small volume nebulizer. The small volume nebulizer is less than how much? 20 cc. That's my medicine cup. That's for my breathing treatment. That's the small volume nebulizer. Let me pause this right quick. Because Mr. Uh, Boy does not have a fume. Show you the small volume nebulizer and the large volume nebulizer. Showed you the large volume already. And here's the small volume, which is your breathing treatment kit. This is considered a small volume nebulizer. I'm going to go over the parts of it so you know the parts. This is called the medicine cup. This is the medicine cup of the small volume nebulizer. You take the medicine cup off and you squirt your medicine down in there, okay? This piece here, which is inside the medicine cup, what I say this was? This is the baffle. Now they're not always the same color or the same shape, but the particle, the device that's inside your medicine cup is the baffle, whether it's green, red, yellow, blue, circle, square, whatever it is, it's the baffle. It makes the big particles into uniform aerosolized smaller particles, okay? Without this baffle, it will not aerosolize, okay? So then I put my lid back on, okay? Then you have <clears throat> small bore tubing, just a regular female on both ends, uh, reservoir, I mean, uh, small bore tubing. It goes on the bottom of my breathing treatment or my small volume nebulizer. Notice how many cc's. Can you see the cc's on here? How many is that? I can, I can say four. Three or four? Okay, so four, probably about six in this one, right? It's a small volume nebulizer because it's less than how many? 20 cc's. 20 cc's or less is considered a small volume nebulizer, okay? This is five, this is about six to 10 because it says four, then it goes up. It's about a six to 10 uh, milli milliliter container. So this is a small volume nebulizer, SVN. Okay, you'll see that's SVN, small volume nebulizer. The large volume will be the LVN, okay? The LVN, which will be this one. This is the large volume because it has 1,000 milliliters of water in it, okay? Now, so you got your small board tubing on your medicine cup. Then you have the T piece, also known as the, what's the T piece called? Briggs adapter. Briggs adapter. Briggs adapter, after I put my medicine in there, I put the Briggs adapter on top, like that, okay? Like that. Now, what's next? This piece here is called the reservoir tube. It only fits on one end, okay? This is the reservoir tube. The reason why it's a reservoir too, because it collects any kind of medicine in between breaths. Your little smoke or your mist will be in here. And so it's coming out too, but you got some in here. So when I inhale, I'm getting not only what's coming from the medicine cup, but what's was in the reservoir tube at the same time. So I get all of that. Without it, if I didn't have the reservoir, then all of my little extra smoke would be, my medicine will be coming out. Okay. I could be inhaling, but all my little extra medicine is lost. So we have a little something on here to help collect it. Okay, just have, kind of help hold the medicine in here, okay? Uh, this is the reservoir tubing. This is the what? Reservoir tubing. reservoir tubing. And then finally, the what? What is this? Mouthpiece. Mouthpiece fits on the other end. This is your small volume nebulizer, or you might as well say breathing treatment device, okay? This is how you give most of your breathing treatments, okay? Now, I'm gonna show you now how it nebulizes or not nebulizes with the baffle. All right, so I'm gonna take it back apart, put it down, and I'm put my medicine. We're gonna play like this uh, <clears throat> saline I'm about to put in there is actually medicine, okay? So I'm gonna take this feed apparatus that I was using for earlier, and I'm just gonna pour a little bit down in here, okay? Now you wouldn't have this much medicine. Kind of came out kind of fast, but that's all right. All 
All right, I'm gonna put this on my e-cylinder so you can see how it works. All right. So my my um, regulator. Of course, I know how the tank went. This on so you can see the actual mist coming out of it. Oh, movie last night called this uh, spell. Have y'all seen that yet? Oh, that's good. And Amari Hardwick, you know who that dude from Power he is? His family is a is some. That's some old voodoo or something. He goes to visit his family and they, they got him put a spell on it. It's on YouTube. Matter of fact, go to YouTube where you can rent and buy movies. Oh, it's on there. Look it up. I've seen it. It's the lady off the uh, Yeah, the lady. Yep. Uh, what's her name? Where's my wrench? Uh, I forgot her. Uh, Loretta Devine or something like that? No, not Loretta Devine. Oh. Is that Loretta Devine? I don't know. But it's good. Yeah, I've seen the preview. We watched it last night. It was fine. Oh, well, I, yeah, I like the movie. It's supposed to turn out Halloween. Oh, okay, but not that long. I got I'm looking for my little tank wrench, and then we can do this. I hate that the, the, the lab is being used. It's not all my stuff right there. I need to go on the road. I'm not going home. <laughs> I think your speaker on, too, on. Huh? Yeah, because every time you say something, it's black out the whole screen. Oh, Lord, it's a lot of time. Also, that sealed book is here now. The sealed book, uh, comprehensive blue review book, that blue book. That blue book is now here, guys. So you need to try to get, uh, pick that book up. Okay, pick that book up. It's got a lot of good information in there. So here's my tank wrench. Let me put this on. Cracking. Yeah, and it's leaking. <laughs> All right, so I've got my cylinder on. Now I got my medicine cup. I want this a little bit too much in here. So usually your medicine will be about like that, about three ml. The medicine, the breathing treatment usually comes in pre-made little vials, three ml, right? It's about three ml. So I would have my medicine in here, put my top back on, <clears throat> put this on, right? And my tubing. One tubing goes to my oxygen cylinder or my oxygen flow, wherever I'm getting it from, the wall or whatever. And the other end goes to my actual nebulizer. Now. See, got it hooked up here. What is this part? What is the safety system right here called? The DISS. Everything after the regulator, the DISS. So I will cut this to about eight liters. See that? That's my aerosol breathing treatment. It's always open. This is my reservoir too. So as I'm breathing, <clears throat> As I'm breathing my breathing treatment through here, it's always some right there collecting. So when I do take the next breath, I get this. If I don't have this here, then that's just being wasted, right? And so it ain't really catching a whole lot, but that it does make a difference, okay? It does, if I close it off, then I can't exhale. So you don't never close it off. <clears throat> but this is my aerosol 
or you want to say this is my small volume nebulizer, giving my aerosol meditation. Okay, inhalation aerosol medicines go like this. And this is my medicine. These are the suspended water particles, right? Hopefully they are between one and three microns in size so that they penetrate far down the uh, bronchial trick or bronchial tree and deposit in the parenchyma. That's what we want down in the alveoli. Now, that all depends on my what? Ventilatory pattern. Now, if I take this and suck it back like that, it's not gonna go down in my parenchyma. It's gonna all slam into the back of my throat. Right? You suck it in like that, you ain't gonna need it. Yeah, really, I'm, I'm already strong. If I'm doing like that, I'm good, right? Good. Because if you got a patient coming out, I can't breathe, and yelling and cussing at everybody else, you breathing. Yeah, you're breathing fine, sir, right? You can tell when somebody really can't breathe, okay? But mentally, if they feel like they can't, give them a treatment. You know, they're paying for it, all right? But anyway, so I'm breathing. My regular ventilatory pattern will matter on how this is deposited. Okay, now if I don't have my baffle, look what happens. I take my baffle out of there and put the top back on. Nothing. Not, not smoking. Those particles are still too really big, right? Huge particles, water particles that are not nebulizing. There's no, no aerosol. You have to have the baffle in order to produce an aerosol. And this baffle is built into the large volume. It's one built up in there that does the work. Okay, there's one built up in there that does the work. But this is a small volume nebulizer that must have this baffle on the inside. But air is coming. See that? There's a little bit of little uh, spigot right there. The air is coming out of there. And what happens is it is pushed through this baffle. And when it comes across the top of the baffle is when it uh, generates those particles. It's really amazing how they do it. But as soon as I put this on here, see that? A whole lot, right? Then I have to put this on there and this will kind of guide it into the right way. So this is a, and sometimes when it's getting ready to go out, see how I can hear it kind of going out, you tap the sides and then it'll give you a little bit more because it starts to collect on the side. See those bubbles all on the side? They start to collect and as they drop, watch those bubbles drop. When they drop, they get sucked into the baffle. See that? So was a smart person to design that the way it is. Yeah, really. His name might have been Baffle. You never know. It, you, you, you find a lot of stuff like that. So when you see my name on something out there, <laughs> you say, he said he was going to do it. I ain't playing either, for real. All right. So that is a small volume nebulizer, which gives us our medication. Don't forget, one of the key differences between humidity and aerosol is that aerosol can deliver medicine. Okay. All right. So it is a small volume nebulizer, less than 20 cc, sometimes used for IPPB, which is intermittent positive pressure breathing that we don't use that machine anymore, but you still need to know the concept. It's used primarily for what? Delivery of medication. All right, then you have a mainstream nebulizer and a side stream. These are just nebulizers that either have, it's either on the side, the little nebulizer ported on the side or regular. Okay. I have a question. Yes. Um, I know what medication is, but what is medication on? <laughs> That's Mr. McCarthy's medicine. Medication. Oh, what I do? <laughs> All right. So you got the side stream and the mainstream. Side mainstream gas flow directly through the nebulizing chamber, just directly through. Side stream, it says aerosol is not created in the main gas flow, but on the side flow. It says uh, about 50% of the particles are in one to five micron size, okay? So one to five microns is what these can generate, all right? 
but what do we say was therapeutic? The best therapeutic range is one to three, okay? Uh, some of them give up, <clears throat> you're gonna learn that some nebulizers do 0. 0.5 to five or 0. 0.5 to three, right? But 0. 0.5 is smaller than one, so that 0. 0.5 micron is going to go in and come out. One to three is the best, okay? But that's depending on your ventilatory pattern, all right? Now, the next nebulizer is the Babington. Now, this is a really a crazy one that I don't see why they used it, but it's used a lot in construction and stuff now. Uh, but it is a hydrosphere, also known as a hydrosphere. And what happens is <clears throat> you have a, a little like a glass ball almost. And the ball has a, the little hollow glass sphere has a little hole on the side of it. All right. Then the film over the port from a dripping fluid on the outer surface. So you have a, a, a dripping fluid dripping on a little glass, like a light bulb, like a light bulb with a hole in it. And there's a fluid that film that drips over it. So once it gets to that hole, it, it sprays out a mist. Okay, that's pretty much. Um, gas exits ports in the sphere. So like a little hole in the, in the uh, light bulb. And once the, the liquid or whatever you're trying to nebulize, you, you drip it on the light bulb and as it coats the light bulb, when it gets to that hole, it sprays out. Simple, it's just like, kind of like if water running down your face by your mouth and when it gets to your mouth, <laughs> You do that and it makes a spray. The same thing the Babington is. You don't really, you never see this. You won't see it. <clears throat> but that's a Babington nebulizer, also known as a hydrosphere. That's the one with the glass sphere with a hole on the side of it. All right. It produces a high volume of aerosol. Particles are three to five microns. Okay. Particles are three to five microns. And it's a lot of them. All right. It's a lot of them. Then the famous. Dubious ultrasonic nebulizer. <clears throat> you will be tested on several questions of the ultrasonic, and I'm waiting on it to be taken off because it's so old we, we hardly don't use it anymore. But what you need to write by <clears throat> the ultrasonic nebulizer, one thing is vibrating mesh. You will have a test question on the board exam when you get to that. It talks about how aerosols are delivered through a ventilator you would say via a vibrating mesh, okay? <clears throat> a vibrating mesh. Uh, the ultrasonic uses a vibrating mesh, right? That has a piezoelectric disc in it, okay? The magic piece is called the piezoelectric disc. I'm gonna put vibrating, Okay. <clears throat> the piezo electric disc. We call it the I call it the magic crystal. Piezo electric magic crystal. I'm gonna have that a little something like that with my son. I have a question. Yes. I may have missed this. What is IPPB? That's intermittent positive pressure breathing. But we don't call it, we don't use that anymore, the machine that they're talking about. But we'll talk about that more when we get to J. That's the last okay. unit. All right, so the ultrasonic nebulizer, man, the ultrasonic nebulizer was one of the OGs of respiratory, okay? Really old machine, but still high-end quality, okay? It converts electrical energy into mechanical energy via the vibrating mix. As a matter of fact, let me put that right here vibrating mesh. Please remember that word, vibrating mesh. You're gonna see that a lot in your uh, on your board. That's what they're talking about. When they talk about the ultrasonic nebulizer and the piezoelectric disc or crystal, that's via the vibrating mesh. It just vibrates real, real fast, right? Very, very fast. So that electrical energy, when you plug it up to the wall, because it's, it's electrical power, you plug it up to the wall and it turns that electrical energy from the wall into mechanical vibrations, right? Very, very high vibrations. So high that the vibrations, they vibrate at a frequency, okay? And that frequency is controlled by the FCC. It's so strong that the FCC has a standard for the, uh, for the vibrating mesh. It can only vibrate at a certain frequency because different frequencies can harm your brain, okay? 
Uh, so it's um, so let's we're, we're getting to that. Uh, it converts electrical energy into mechanical energy uh, via the vib by vibrating mesh. Okay, it uses a piezoelectric disc. This is a very important word. Whenever you see this, they talking about the ultrasonic. That's telltale. They say piezoelectric. You know they talking about the ultrasonic. Now, when we say vibrating mesh, this is the same thing, guys, as when you go to Walmart or you go to Walgreens in the wintertime. What's the first thing they got on the end caps and they own? Trying to get you to buy it. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, when, when, as soon as you walk in the door at Walgreens in the wintertime, these humidifiers, right? Humidifiers, but this is really a... It's really a nebulizer because you can see it, but they call them humidifiers, okay? But when you come in, they have that humidifier that you can see all that white smoke coming out. That's an ultrasonic nebulizer. That's what that is. It uses a piezoelectric disc or vibrating mesh to make that smoke, okay? You uh, pour the water into a container and it drips onto a piezoelectric disc and that disc turns that water into high mist and comes out. You don't hear it. It's not loud. It doesn't pop. I mean, you know, like you're going to hear it moving around. It's just silent, right? But you turn it on, you're like, how does that do that, right? It's because it's a vibrating mesh. And the reason why it's out is because the humidity level in the wintertime is down. So they're trying to, here you go. Come on, get your humidity level up in your house, uh, in your room, stuff like that. That dry air, cold air can cause you to crack and burn and, and all those other things, right? So the piezoelectric disc is what's used in those nebulizers that you see at, at Walgreens, okay? That's what that is. That's what the trick is to make that much smoke, okay? Now, the current changes the shape of the disc, right? When you plug it up, that disc changes shape, right? The shape changes are vibrations that transfer from the cupulent compartment across a dome-shaped diaphragm to the nebulizer compartment. The vibrations set up waves breaking off the little particle, okay? You don't have to know that part. Just know that it takes electrical energy, transfers it into mechanical energy by vibrating mesh, and it uses a piezoelectric disc to do this, okay? The vib uh, this is important. 90% of all of the particles that come from the ultrasonic nebulizer are 0.5 to 3 microns. So that's really good, right? That's really good. It's really close to therapeutic. 90%, they boast that 90% of our particles are going to be 0.5 to 3 microns. So you need to buy my product, okay? So when I'm trying to make a decision on what I need to do for my patient, I'm going to be looking at the choices I have, which one is best for my patient, okay? So ultrasonic nebulizer converts electrical energy into what? mechanical energy. It converts electrical energy into mechanical energy by yeah, using the vibrating mesh from the piezoelectric disc. Okay? The coupling part, you don't have to know. But you do need to know, number four, 90% of those particles are 0.5 to 3 microns, right? All right, very important. Now, uh, ultrasonic continue. Look at C. The frequency is predetermined by who? FCC, which is the Federal Commerce Commission. They, they uh, determine the frequency, how fast that vibration is happening. That's a frequency, because it's like FM and AM, those are frequencies, right? Those are vibrating radio waves. Uh, well, this also has a vibration that's so strong that it's controlled by the FCC, right? 90% of the particles are 0.5 to 3 microns in size. Continue on. See, so still talking about it. Uh, it's set at 1 to 2 megacycles a second, so usually about 1.36 megahertz. And that is what? Not what? Adjustable. You can't adjust that. The FCC does that, right? So on the back of it, it will tell you FCC stamp on there telling you what megahertz it's going to run at. And that's as fast as it's going to let you do it, okay? But you can control the amplitude. 
I can't control how fast it vibrates, but I can adjust the amount that it's putting out. All right, because it might be too much. I'm like, damn, that's too much. Turn it down some. I can turn the amplitude down, but I cannot control the frequency. The amplitude is adjustable and will alter the what? Output. Okay. Don't worry about the separate gas, separate uh, nebulizing gas flow. That's not even important. It can be used in line with a ventilator, IPPB machine, uh, the MetaNeb, aerosol high flow systems, right? I can use it in line. So they're saying, when I say in line, that means I can open up the circuit and put it in line, right? So if I have a high flow, say I have a person on a high flow or aerosol tray collar, right? Aerosol tray collar has the large volume nebulizer, then the water trap and the patient, right? I can put that in between there. I can hook up an ultrasonic to make it even more if I'm trying to induce sputum, all right? If I'm trying to induce sputum, make them cough up some good old stuff for me to go test, all right? I can put it in line with a ventilator, right? That's just telling you you can use it in line with, with different things. Now, this is, this is what's important here as well. Output, how much can it put out? Six cc's per minute of water vapor can come out of that. That's a lot. Six cc's a minute can come out, all right? Six cc's is not, not, a, not a, uh, a small amount. That's a nice little amount. It's almost a whole syringe full. Every minute, that much water is turned into vapor. That's what it's claiming. 90% of the particles are 0.5 to 3 microns, and I can pump out six cc's per minute, all right? Ultrasonic nebulizer converts electrical energy to what? By vibrating mesh and the piezoelectric what? Disc, all right. 90% of the particles that come from the ultrasonic nebulizer are? 0.5 All right. The frequency or how fast it vibrates is determined by? FCC. All right. Amplitude, I can adjust, right? All right. And it can push, produce up to? All right. That's the ultrasonic nebulizer. The main reason, now write this down, the main reason we use the ultrasonic nebulizer is for sputum induction. Sputum induction. Trying to produce some sputum. And now you, you, uh, sputum, remember, is a mixture of mucus in the lungs and saliva and all the stuff of the mouth. When that mixes together, it's called what? Sputum. Sputum is the mixture of the mucus, right? If I cough up some mucus, when it gets from my mouth and mixes with the saliva, now it's called sputum, all right? Sputum is a mixture of that, all right? Remember we said sputum has DNA in it, debris, all those kind of things. Remember we talked about that? That's sputum, all right? Now, the reason why I would want to induce sputum, guys, is if I want to go test it. If I'm not sure, my patient comes in with a fever, uh coughing short of breath right when i'm the doctor he's coughing up yellow stuff the doctor gonna say well i want a sputum sample from him right and if he can't cough it up i can put an ultrasonic nebulizer mask on him and he'll breathe all them particles in see and that'll loosen up that stuff real good so he can produce a sputum sample for me he'll spit in the cup seal it off and send it to the lab okay that's gonna let me know whether he has some type of uh tuberculosis does he have some type of uh acetobacter um, pseudomonas, anything like that from his lungs, right? To see if that's the reason he's febrile, right? White blood cell is up, he's febrile, he's short of breath, his sats are low. Well, give me a sputum sample. Let's run that to the lab to see if that's what's causing the problem. And once we do that, guys, we get that sputum sample, take it to the lab and drip. What do we drip on it? We drip different antibiotics on it, okay? Once we see what it is, I say we say, oh, yeah, he has pseudomonas. We take that pseudomonas and we drip different antibiotics on it and see which one of the antibiotics do what? Kill it. If whatever I find out which one it's sensitive to, that's the medicine that I prescribe. That's how we fix it, okay? 
you get a sputum sample or a bronchoscopy sample, right? Send him to the lab. Oh, he got pseudomonas, right? Well, let's see which one his pseudomonas is reactive to or sensitive to. We drop tobramycin on it, don't do nothing. Penicillin on it, didn't do nothing. Gentamicin, ooh, that killed it. So then we take the gentamicin, prescribe gentamicin via aerosol, and give it to him as a breathing treatment twice a day. That's how you fix it, okay? But you got to get the sputum sample first, so this is how you get it, right? You don't want them just to <coughs> and spit some spit in there. I want sputum. I want a good mixture. Cough that stuff up, a hoggy, loogie, right? That's what we want so that we can find out what you really have, okay? So it's used to induce what? Sputum. All right. One more, and then we're going to take another break. The next nebulizer, or the last one, is the spinning disc. This is my favorite. The spinning disc nebulizer. Spinning disc nebulizer. Now let me show you the spinning disc nebulizer. Because this is my favorite one. I used to use this ever since I've been a little boy. It helps me sleep. Because the sound, it's a it's a hum, little hum and it's a little mist like that. And it sprays cool. You can see it come out. A little cool mist on my face. My mom used to wake me up and my little peach fuzz be white. So that mist. <laughs> I love it. And that helps me sleep. So to this day, I use a spinning disc nebulizer. I'm going to show it to you. Spinning disc nebulizer. See if they got a good one to show. They always got some weak ones on there. Show the old school one. I think that's why I had to show one last time. I had to go home and actually show film mine so y'all could see it. Oh. oh. That sucks. Anyway, I'll show it to you later. I think I got one of me doing it at home. But it's really, really rudimentary. It's, it's simple, guys. It, it's, it's just simple in a nutshell. And it's like, wow, that's how that works. But I love it. And so what happens is this, go back to my lesson plan. Okay, can y'all see the lesson plan? Okay. The spinning disc uh, uses a rotating platter. It's just a little platter that spins really, really fast, okay? The platter spins, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's the motors on the bottom, and it's got a little stick with a platter on the bottom. And it's the stick, you turn the stick, the whole platter turns, okay? And if you plug it up, it spins really, really fast. So if I take some water and I just pour it on the disc, as soon as the water hits the disc, it right, turns into a mist, right? And the platter itself have little cones on the side, like my fingers. So this platter is spinning inside my hand. You drop the water in, or it's got this tube that sucks it in, and it comes out the bottom of the stick. Hits that platter and mist, right? Shoot through these cones here and inside of the container, and it directs it out to the spigot, okay? It's old school. I don't even think, it's hard to find these uh, because they, they keep up a lot of bacteria if you don't keep it clean, all right? But I don't, it's, I had to order mine uh, online because they couldn't, I couldn't find it, all right? But it's a spinning disc nebulizer uh, that will uh, allow water to hit the disc and spin out and turn into a mist that's a cool mist. It feels wonderful. It has a nice little hum to it and I, and I go to sleep. Another reason I fell in love with it because I used to put my little He-Man's arm in the thing, right? And turn it on and just spin them around real fast. Or I would do stuff and put a, like a pencil or a crayon on this and it would make the circle, you know, just being kid, a boy. Uh, but ever since I was young, I used, I, I've used the spinning disc, right? So the spinning disc nebulizer is a awesome nebulizer. And I'll say I'll, after the break, I'll show it to you if I can find it during the break. All right. 
but let's finish up for, before break. All right, so it drips fluid onto the surface of the spinning platter. Centripetal force uh, spins the fluid off the platter into those breaker cones, those little breaker cones I said on the side. And that creates an aerosol stream, all right? It delivers about 25 to 75% relative humidity. Caution must be taken to avoid contamination and is usually room, used as a room humidifier, okay? It's usually used to humidify a room, all right? Uh, that's why I love it. it. was really, a spinning disc is awesome, okay? During the break, I'll find it and I'll show it to you. Now, these are the last part before break. The general uh, considerations to remember, 44 milligrams of liter per water is what the target volume is, right? Why is that the target volume? Because that's what the body does. We trying to match the body. We ain't trying to do no more, no less, okay? So 44 milligrams of, per liter of water is the target volume. That's how much volume of water we're trying to deliver, all right? Because the water, I mean, the body does that. The third pretty... I say therapeutic, Lord, ninjas. The therapeutic range of an aerosol particle to reach the alveoli is between one to three microns, right? One to three microns. And the microns has that little U and G sound, right? That little U and a little funny looking U and a G. That's the micron thing, all right? Symbol for microns. Uh, smaller exhale back out, right? If they're smaller than 0.1, I mean, if they're smaller than one, like 0.5 or 0.3, they get exhaled back out. The larger ones deposit before reaching what? Alveoli, because they're too big, okay? Nebulizers are a potential source of nosocomial infections. Make sure these are, these are just general rules of thumb, right? Number four, electrical nebulizers are potential shock hazards, duh, right? Be careful, because you're dealing with water and electricity, so always be very careful with that. Number five, nebulizers actually add fluid to the body. So patients need to be careful. I mean, need to be carefully monitored not to give them fluid overload, okay? Those are the general considerations to remember about nebulizers and humidifiers as far as they are concerned, okay? All right, it's 10.05, let's take a 20 minute break. Come back at 10.25, 10.25 and we're gonna, go into our chest physiotherapy. Now we're going into the chest physiotherapy and changing the shape and, and, and the positioning in order to drain those segments, okay? I still got a nice little amount to cover today, y'all. So chest physical therapy, starting with postural drainage. It means turning them to drain those segments. We will do that at 1025. I want to pause recording now to 1025. All right, guys, so let's finish up. I want to show you a couple of things right quick um, before we I want to show you the ultrasonic nebulizer. Now I'm going to have to, I'm going to stop the recording while I'm showing the video. This is an example of the Babington nebulizer. When you have the sample uh, material, whether it's medicine or water or whatever, it coats the glass sphere and air is forced in this way. And when it gets to the hole, it shoots out into a mist, okay? That's the Babington nebulizer. All right, we also have um, uh, I wanna show you the weak type and all that right quick too. So we can go on and show you that uh, types of Humidifier types, okay, right here. This is a quick picture of all three of them, right? Look, you got the bubble humidifier, which is for your low flow device, right, of your nasal cannula. And it talks about how if you have it hooked up to the flow meter, the oxygen comes down to those little holes at the bottom of the bubble and they make bubbles right here. The longer those bubbles are touching water, the more humidity they build up. So the, the big one is better than the smaller one, right? But then the gas, those bubbles pick up humidification and come to this way to the patient, right? Then you have the Passover type. The Passover, remember, is for your high flow. Everything is high flow except for the bubble. This is a low flow humidifier. The rest of the humidifiers and nebulizers are all high flow systems. So you have the Passover, where it's just simply a 
humidifier with water in it, air comes in from here, passes over, picks up the moisture, comes to the patient. But the Passover has a couple types. You've got the wick type, right, where you have wicks sticking down in the water that pick up the uh, moisture, right? They soak up the paper towel, soaks up the moisture. As the gas comes in, it picks up the moisture on the wicks and comes out to the patient. And then on this side, you have a picture of the membrane type, where simply a paper towel type membrane, hydrophobic membrane that separates the gas from the water and it soaks up the moisture through here. So as the vapor and moisture goes through this membrane, it's picked up by the gas going across and goes to the patient, okay? So those are a couple types there that I wanted to show you. Right, so that's been that's been recorded. All right, let's finish up. Now we're going into our chest physiotherapy. Uh, postural drainage is the first one. CPT is chest physical therapy, right? Whether we're doing drainage or whether we're actually patting on the body, the chest to perform uh, percussion therapy. Okay, chest percussion therapy or chest physical therapy, pretty much the same thing. Uh, they're interchangeable. All right, they're usually being used interchangeably. Now, when this humidification and nebulizers, the ultrasonic nebulizers, all this stuff is trying to loosen up those secretions so you can have a more productive cough, right? But when they fail to work alone, now we need to step up, take a step up. Now we go into actual physical stuff, okay? The chest physical therapy, right? The first part of the chest physical therapy we want to talk about is the postural drainage, right? When we actually turn that segment, trying to drain the stuff out of that segment, right? Now we said that just like that game you have with that ball and you're trying to move the table where that ball will go through the little maze, that's what you're trying to do with the lung. You're trying to get that part of the lung up in the air, okay? So that you can drain it. We said that the, we always use the, I always use the same, um, Example, the left lower lobe and the right lower lobe both have a superior segment, which is in the back, right? So when we want to drain the superior segment, we must turn the patient on prone, right? They have to be prone in order to drain the superior segment, okay? Now, <clears throat> let me share you this. I told you guys to make sure you watched um, Dr. McNally's video. Remember that? Who all watched it? Dr. McNally's uh, segment video. I did. Good, because that gave you a picture of where those segments are on the tra tracheal bronchial tree, all right? Because now you need to know where they are so that you can know how to drain them, all right? That was here, Dr. McNally, that is in your pulmonary A&P module. Go back to pulmonary A&P if you want to watch it again later, but you come down to the McNally segmental bronchi video, all right? Sometimes you have to, just, uh, you're recording. When you come to McNally segment of video, guys, because you need to go back to this so you will know where these segments are, so you know how to turn the body to drain them, okay? This is very important because just because you memorize what segments were in each lobe don't mean you know where in that lobe it is and how to drain it. How would I turn my patient to drain it, okay? So you have to get a good little refresh on this right here. Now, you want to, now, when I show this video in class today, I can't record it because it's another video and it might stop the whole recording because it's copyright, okay? That's his video. So I'm going to stop recording, but I am going to show it. So those who are watching live will get that benefit. Also, the ones that are not watching live, you have to go back and watch it for yourself. I'm telling you how to get to it. So it's under the pulmonary A&P module of our canvas. When you pull Dr. McNally's segmental video, this is going to show up. All you have to do is come here. See this right here? Come bring your arrow to this and click it, and it's going to take you to the video. Okay? So you can get to the video. 
pause that and I'm going to stop the recording and we're going to watch his video, which we're going to talk about the segments, those segmental bronchi, because the segmental bronchi go into their perspective segments. Okay. And so once you know where that is, you know, okay, well, then I need to, if I wanted to drain that one, I would need to turn this way, or I would need to turn sit up. Or I need to be supine, or do I need to be prone? Do I need to be Trendelenburg with my head down, feet up, right? That's what you gotta know for this lab. You're gonna know have to turn your mannequin the right way to drain these segments. This is a big lab coming up. All right, so I'm pause recording. Wonderful video learning the segments because those colored parts right there are the uh, segments of the lungs, right? And so wherever those uh, segmental bronchi are, that's where the segment is. So now you're getting ready to learn how to drain those segments. But if you had no idea where the superior segment is, then you have no idea how to drain it. You have your patient upside down and all kind of stuff and not know because the physician may say, hey, I need you to go and drain, do some posterior drains on uh, his anterior medial, ba uh, anterior medial uh, segment, right? And you'll be like, where is that at, right? If you don't know, you can't do it. All right, you have to know this stuff, okay? So here we go. Let's see, plan. All right, postural drainage. Positioning each segmental bronchi in a vertical position to allow gravity to drain that segment. That's what postural drainage is, okay? What are the indications of postural drainage? Well, to mobilize accumulated secretions due to a few different things. Somebody who may have COPD, uh, suffering from dehydration, right? Because if it's dehydrated, it ain't gonna move. You're gonna have to get it out of there. And acute pulmonary disease, some type of pulmonary disease that's causing secretions to become extra or stuck in those segments. The second indication is prophylactically when there's a history of it. So if you know Mr. Johnson always comes in around wintertime, COPD is exacerbation. He always has loculated secretions in his superior segment. So we always have to lay him down and do a little CPT on the back, right, while he's prone to help move those secretions. So if I know he's coming, I'm gonna automatically do a little drainage because I know he always he's always has it. Okay. So that's prophylactic, means to prevent, right? We're just gonna do it just just because. Like condoms are called prophylactics. You're trying to prevent problems, all right? All right, so like I said, it said remind you of the segments. So we've already done that. We just went over a video to remind you of those segments and make sure you memorize where those segments are and what and which lobe they pertain to. It wasn't just to know it for that test and that's it. You got to know it for your career, all right? So go back and study that very well tonight, all right? Here are the positions for each segment. Here we go. The right upper lobe has three segments, right? Apical, if, if you have secretions in the apical segment, you want to have them semi-fowlers at 45 degrees. If the secretions are in the anterior segment of the right upper lobe, you want the head of the bed flat, patient supine. All right, so they supine how they land on their back. So the head of the bed is flat. The bed is flat, laying flat on their back. That's how you drain the anterior portion of the right upper lobe because anterior is in the front of the lung, right? So you want to lay on their back so it'll drain toward the middle. All this has to drain toward the... Huh? My notes don't show the upper lobe and middle lobe of the right side. Okay, well write it down. It's right here on, on, on the, the, the thing. Just write it down. Right upper lobe you have the apical segment, must be drained semi-fowlers at 45 degrees. The anterior segment of the right upper lobe, the head of the bed must be flat and the patient is supine. The posterior segment of the right upper lobe, head of the bed flat, patient is one fourth or higher from prone, right side up. Okay, so they'll be laying flat, 
prone, but you turn their right side up one fourth uh, from prone. Okay, so it's kind of like twisted. He's laying on his stomach, <clears throat> but his right side is up, right? One fourth from prone. So you start out prone, but you, let me show you. Uh, well, I'll show, I'll let you write that down and then I'll show you. It's kind of hard to uh, do it when I'm sitting in the chair, but I'll show you the best way I can. All right. Just write the upper load right quick and then I'll let, come back and let you write the middle load. You got the upper load wrote down? Okay. So what they're saying is you're gonna lay the patient flat, right? He's gonna be prone, but his right side is gonna be turned one fourth up. So you're laying flat, but you got like a pillar under his right side, just one fourth turn up. So it kind of, that top one will drain into the airway. That's what you're trying to do. Not completely on his side, you're prone, but that right side is up just a little bit, one fourth turn. So you laying down, but you have his body cocked up on the right side about one fourth a turn. Not a whole half a turn, just one fourth a little turn. Okay, so they land flat, you put a little pillow on that right side, the right side up, just one fourth from prone. Okay, that's what that means. Okay, trying to make them comfortable. All right, right middle lobe. It has two segments, the medial and the lateral, right? So if there are secretions built up in the medial segment of the right middle lobe, then you need to have the head of the bed down 12 to 14 inches, right side up, one fourth or higher from supine, okay? So they were supine, and then you turn that right side up, one fourth inches up, and the head of the bed down 14 to uh, 12 to 14 inches. You don't have to remember the inches part just remember that the head of the bed should be down and the patient is supine with one fourth turned up on the right side, okay? That right side, so they land on their back this time, but they have their, their right side is cocked up one fourth turned up, right, from supine, but the head of the bed has to be down, so they're in Trendelenburg. Anytime the head is lower than the feet, that's Trendelenburg, all right? So we're draining like that. but not a whole lot. It's just 12 to 14. So it's head of the bed down, but not too much because the next one, the head of the bed is gonna be down even more. And when you come to lab, uh, for lab, we're gonna, you know, you have your mannequin and you can turn them and turn the bed and do a little practice before we check off. But you definitely need to be in the lab book for what's that, whatever the lab book has for the syllabus, in the syllabus for you to complete, make sure you complete it because I don't even think I took up the lab work from last lab, I'll, I'll look at that next lab, but don't forget to do these assignments because they help you tremendously into, into uh, performing your lab, okay? Now, the lateral side of the right middle lobe. So if my secretions are built up on the lateral side of my right middle lobe, then I need to lay my patient right side up completely, head of the bed down 16 to 18 inches, okay? <clears throat> so. For instance, right side up. So this is a this is a right lung. Okay. This is a right lung. It's my left lung, my patient's right. Okay, so if I'm let, doing that section, I need to have the right side up completely. Patient laying on his side, on his left side, right? Completely on his left side, because you want that right lung, you want that right lung to be up like that. The left lung will be down here completely. And then what else? Right lung is up, and what else? Head of the bed down, how much? So like that. Right side is up, and then tilt the head of the bed down. And that's gonna drain that lateral segment down into the upper, into the larger airway, okay? Not just straight down, but not only straight down, but it's gonna go kind of like this, right? It's gonna go at an angle, down and up, because you got the head of the bed down, right? So that's how you would, do your, your patient then, turn him on his left side with his right side up and head of bed down, okay? That is for that one. All right, continue. What about my right lower lobe? Well, 
we said we already know about the superior, right? The superior segment of the right lower low, what happens? Head of the bed flat and the patient is prone. Patient prone. So head of the bed is flat, patient prone. He laying on his stomach, right? This is his front part. This is his back. He's not tilted, no kind of way. He's straight up flat, prone, right? Head of the bed, the whole bed is flat, and he's laying on his stomach. And we would tap on that superior segment to get that stuff to fall out of that segment and drain into the larger airway so he can cough it up. Okay, so flat and prone. For the superior segment. That's the same way for the superior segment of the left lower lobe. So both of those are flat and prone, right? All right. Now, right lower lobe. Now, superior segment of the right lower lobe was head of the bed flat, face, and prone. With pill. Now, you can put some pillows under their abdomen or not, right? That's just kind of for the kind of cock their, their butt up a little bit, right? Because that if you if you put them on their belly and you put some pillows on there, that'll kind of cock that bottom up just a little bit, right? Imagine if you're laying on your stomach and somebody put a pillow under your abdomen. That will kind of pop your lungs, the back of your lungs up just a little bit, okay? Still flat, but the pillow's usually for a little extra pump or um, comfort, all right? Now, we're still in the right lower low. What about the anterior basal section or segment of the right lower lobe, head of the bed down, 18 to 20 inches, patient what? Supine, okay? Patient supine this time. So remember, this is the front. So now he's gonna be, he's gonna be supine, right? Which is flat, this is supine. And the head of the bed what? Down 18 inches, right? So he's from Dellenberg and supine this time. That's how you would drain uh, that segment of the right lower lobe. Okay? Let's continue. Lateral basal. What about the lateral basal segment of the right lower lobe? Head of the bed down 18 to 20 inches. Patient laying what? Right side up. All right? Right side up. So. This is my right, right? So this is my left. So I'm going to have my right side up and the head of the bed what? Down. Okay. Posterior basal, the posterior basal segment of the right lower lobe, you put the head of the bed down 18 to 20 inches and the patient what? Prone. Okay. So, head of the bed is what? Down. Down, and the patient is what? Down. Prone. Head of the bed down, patient prone. Head of the bed down, patient is prone. He laying on his stomach. All right. Now, let's go to the left side. To drain the segments of the left upper low, all right? Now we're on the left side, left upper low. I don't have a left long, but we're going to just the opposite, okay? Uh, the anterior segment of the left upper low is the same as the right anterior segment, okay? So the same one. So the left, the anterior segment of the left upper low is the same as the right upper low. So the right, see the anterior of the right upper low, head of the bed flat, patient supine. Okay, same thing. So some of them are the same. You don't have to, there's not necessarily one for each and every segment. Some of them share a position, okay? So it just, it just told you that. It said that the left upper lobe, the anterior segment of the left upper lobe is the same as the right anterior segment of the right upper lobe, okay? What about the apical posterior segment of the left upper lobe? All right, now, head of the bed is what? Up 30 degrees, patient on the left side, one-fourth or higher from prone. <laughs> All right, so, yeah, yeah, left side, okay, yeah, left side is up, so they're laying on their right side, okay? So they're laying on their right side, all right, head of the bed up 30 degrees, patient is left side up, okay, one-fourth or higher from prone, okay? So let's look at that. So this is my right, so this is my left lung we're talking about, right? 
So left lung will be what? Up. So this time the, the left lung will be up. Pa patient laying on his left. Head of the bed is what? Up 30 degrees, right? So you're in the bed. Because when you're in the bed, this is what we mean by degrees. Flat will be 180, right? When you come up to 30 degrees, so you'll be up this way, right? So, so what else did it say? So with 30 degrees, left side is up. What? One foot from higher from prone. Okay, so I would be this way, right? Laying in the bed like you land in the bed and they raise the bed up, right? You know how you do a push up and lean up like that? This is how I'm in the bed. I'm in the bed, but I'm, my, my front part is with a pillar in my face, right? I'm laying this way from prone, 30 degrees. Okay, so it's 30 degrees up and what? 34, I'm saying I'm, I'm prone, 30 degrees up, one fourth or higher from what? Um, what side is up? So this like that. See that? I'm laying like this, right? With the, the bed is this way, pillar in my face, 30 degrees. And then I turn from prone, right side up, one fourth or higher from prone, right? Mm -hmm. So just kind of like this. So I might put a pillow or something right here and have that part of my left lung up. So that part is up so it can drain diagonal into my airway, okay? It's just all about like that ball. What I gotta do to get that ball in that hole, right? So wherever I'm trying to do, that's what I'm trying to drain. Wherever segment I'm trying, I'm trying to get that segment up in the air, okay? Wherever it is, I want it up in the air. So if it's a segment on my lateral, I need to get it up in the air. If it's that superior segment, I need to stay on my back so I can have it up in the what? In the air. All you're trying to do is get those segmental bronchi directly up in the air. So whatever you got to do, that's why you have to know where they are. Okay? You have to know where they are. So that's going to take practice. That's going to take study to look back at the uh, segments, look in your book, because the book has the segments. Read your book. It's going to tell you. I hope y'all are reading. Because you can't do all this with just a lecture. All right. Now, superior lingua of the left upper lobe will be headed to bed down 12 to 14 inches. Patient left side up, one fourth or higher from supine. Okay. And then inferior lingua is the same as the superior lingua. Okay. Same as above. And finally, last one, left lower lobe. The segments of the left lower lobe, which are four of them. The superior segment of the left lower lobe is the same as the right superior, right? Or the right lower lobe, same way, prone and flat, okay? Prone and flat. What about the anterior medial segment? The anterior medial segment of the left lower lobe is the same as the anterior basal of the right. Same way. Okay, so you got to go back up there and see which way that is. C, what about the lateral basal? The lateral basal of the left lower lobe, head of the bed, down 18 to 20 inches, patient left side what? Up. Left side up, head of the bed down. That will drain that lateral basal. Lateral basal. And finally, posterior basal. Posterior basal is the same as the right posterior basal. Okay? Same as the right posterior basal. So make sure you guys go back, look at your segments, and study that video again so that you know them by heart. Okay, I know that segment is there. So what will I do? Because when you're checking off, I'm not checking to see if you got it 20 inches or 16 inches or is that more than one-fourth supine, one-fourth turn? We're not measuring like that. We're just trying to see if you got the general idea of how to get that segment up in the air. As long as you can do that, you're fine. Because nobody's going to be in the, at the doctor's office, that ain't one-fourth supine, right? Nobody's measuring one-fourth an inch or inches or nothing like that. Nobody's measuring that. But you should have a very good drift, gist of where you're supposed to have that segment. If you're in there and you don't, have, you even know where the segment is, you're going to not be able to do that. You're not going to get checked off. You don't have to check you off, okay? You have to have studied and practiced or uh, read or whatever you need to do. Turn your family member, your child, whatever you got to do to know this. So when you come, we do a little instruction, kind of go over a few things, and you check off. If you don't study, we have some students that never study. They ain't even looked at it. 
And then they come to the lab and when you say, okay, turn them in this, and they like, don't even know what prone is from supine. You gotta go. You're not gonna be able to be checked off. That's gonna be one you're gonna have to make up, right? Because if you don't make them up, it's a fail, right? So it's on you. You have to be accountable of this information. So whatever you gotta do, time you gotta take, you gotta do it, right? I told you it's gonna get tougher and tougher. We almost done, but you got to notice we can't teach it again in lab, right? That's why it's good for you guys to be here, okay? All right, now, those are the segments and how to turn your body for those segments. You're just trying to, guys, get that segmental bronchi up in the air, all right? So if you look at that video, it shows you the color code of all those segmental bronchi. It's in your book, right? Read and uh, study it. You won't have a problem, right? But we're not ticky. We're not being extra ticky. I'm just going to make sure you know how to get that segment up in the air, okay? It's got to be very close to what it's supposed to be. Now, there are some reasons why I wouldn't do it. There are some reasons why we don't do postural drainage. Number one is empyema. Say empyema. Empyema. That is pus in a segment. I don't want to drain an infection, right? If I know that you have an infection, a whole bunch of pus in your superior lobe, I don't want to turn you to where it drains into the other lobes, right? Now I have spread what? Infection. So if I know it's an empyema, I'm not going to mess with it, all right? We're not going to do no drainage. If somebody has flailed chest, then chest movement could be harmful. Flailed chest, you need to write this down, is two or more broken ribs in two or more places. So you have a rib that's broken two or more places and you got two or more ribs that's like that. That's called flail chest. Chest has no stability. The thorax has no stability because you got two or three broken ribs and those broken ribs are broke in two or more places, not just one break, but that one rib is broken two or three places and you got two or three ribs like that. That's a flail chest. We would not do have you turn and turn over. Let me give you some advice. He's doing all that because it's going to hurt too much, right? The pest will be hurt too painful, right? And they can't breathe. We have to really breathe for them when they have flail chest, all right? Wounds. If they got a, some gunshot wounds or if they have a sacral wound, what if he has a huge wound on his behind, right? Sacral wound. You don't want to turn him supine, right? He, he needs to be prone or on his side. And so we're going to say, well, I know you got this huge fist hole in your butt but I, I got to do this uh, drainage, so you got to turn on. He can't do that. It's going to hurt too bad, okay? So you have to be careful, mindful of the wounds of your patient. Spinal cord injury. What if somebody just had a car wreck or a diving injury and in they in a neck brace? Do I want to be turning them upside down and sideways? No, because I may damage that spine and cause them to be what? Paralyzed. So spinal injuries, no. <clears throat> Pneumothorax. If somebody has a hole in their lung, then this ain't going to work. It wouldn't benefit from a pneumothorax. All right. Head injuries. If somebody has a head injury. Now, patients who have traumatic brain injuries, uh, their brain can swell. Okay. Brain can have pressure, added pressure in the brain. Uh, and so we don't want to do anything that would add to that pressure. Okay. So having the patient's head down below his feet will drain the blood to his what? Head and make that pressure higher, which can further damage that injury, okay? So somebody who has a head injury, you would not put, be able to put them in Trendelenburg because that puts all, rush all the blood to the head, which increases the pressure. More volume equals more pressure. So I can't do that, okay? Yeah, you probably could do a few. You probably could do them on the side a little bit, or do some CPT or something. But if they got head injuries and this, and they have a, a lot of them have a bolt in their head. It's called a bolt, an uh, intracranial pressure bolt that's drilled into the skull that measures the pressure in the brain when you have your ICU patients. Uh, and if they're a certain level, you have to be careful. So if they have that, I wouldn't even do it at all. I'm not doing no turning at all. Okay, I might do a little CPT or something like that, but I ain't doing no turning at all. Okay. All right. Indi uh, contraindications continue. Unstable cardiac status. Some people can't lay flat. They can't breathe, right? Some people with CHF or something or, or COPD, you try to lay them flat. Oh, give me up. I can't breathe, right? That's a heart issue. 
You can't lay flat without being short of breath. You have a cardiac issue, all right? Uh, blood pressure might drop, right? A lot of times when we have patients with low blood pressure, we have them in Trendelenburg because that raises the blood pressure because the blood flows to the midsection, right? So you're trying to sit them up and we got them on Trendelenburg and giving him level fed medicine just to keep his blood pressure to be alive. And here you come putting them back this way. No, don't do that. Okay, don't do that. Because if it's stable, unstable cardiac status, you may kill them by turning them or doing all that. So unstable cardiac status, you wouldn't do drainage. <clears throat> all right, COPD. Now I know COPD is a indication of postural drainage, but at the same time, it depends on your patient. <clears throat> Your COPD patient, if he can tolerate his head being down, then yes, do it. But he may not be able to tolerate it. So the ones that can't tolerate it, you wouldn't do it on them, okay? You wouldn't do it on them. What if somebody is super big, obesity? Would you want to lay them with their head of the bed flat? I mean, head of the bed down, and you got all this 700-pound stomach and all that? You wouldn't have somebody who's 700 pounds in no Trendelenburg, right? That just ain't gonna work. It has too much pressure on their abdomen and on their chest cavity, right? Just like somebody, a woman who's pregnant. If she's pregnant, got twins in there, you don't want to lay her head down or below her feet. You don't want to do that, okay? Or lay her on prone. You want to put a, a pregnant woman that's eight months pregnant prone? Huh? No. <laughs> no, you don't want her laying on her stomach, okay? So pregnancy. And then finally, recent meals. If they just ate a steak and potatoes and ice cream and all that, who you come talking about, I'm gonna need you to uh, be in Trendelenburg, put his head down and what, what might he do? Vomit, yeah, he might vomit all on you and inhale it, okay? So those are some of the contraindications of postural drainage, right? So we learned postural drainage is uh, trying to get that segmental bronchi up vertical in the air. However you gotta turn that body to get that particular segmental bronchi that you learned in the video, the video where it is. You're trying to imagine that, how do I get that one segment in the air, vertical, so it can drain out, okay? And so once we did that, we learned the different positions of those and we have learned the contraindications, relative, right? I mean, you, and it depends on how, how bad it is, it's relative. Uh, empyema, flail chest, wounds, spinal injuries, pneumothorax, head injuries, unstable cardiac status, COPD, if they can't tolerate the head being down, being super obese, pregnant, or just ate a big meal, okay? Those are some of your contraindications of postural drainage, all right? Now, once I got you in that position, now what am I gonna do? Called percussion. Now that I got you in that position, now I can percuss on you to, Right? Help get it on out of there, right? It's draining, but it might not drain fast. I'm going to help the drainage, okay? So if I got you on your side and I'm trying to drain that lateral segment, then I will have my hands cupped like this and you use your wrist, not your arms. You don't smack, but you use a cupping motion. We also have devices that do this, but we have a percussor. If you don't want to do your hands, you can use a machine, vibrator, percussor, uh, a chest vest to shake the whole body, right? We can do a lot of different things to get this stuff off you, okay? This is where we get into the percussion part. And so I would, right, you'll be on that one segment, just on that one segment while he's draining. And so you do that for about five to 10 minutes while they're draining and that'll get that stuff out of there. Yeah, get up, cough, and cough that stuff up, okay? That's chest physiotherapy. This is respiratory therapy. Postural drainage and bronchial hygiene is part of your therapy, okay? It's like a physical therapy, help you walk and do all this other stuff. We help you take breathing treatments, breathe, live, breathe, bring you back to life, all of that, right? And also help the stuff come down out of the segment, okay? Postural drainage, or we call it um, bronchial hygiene, bronchial hygiene, okay? All right, so let's look at the uh, uh, chest percussion. What is percussion? Clapping the chest wall with cupped hands, right? Relaxed wrist to set up vibrations and loosen secretions. Because once they're trapped up in there, sometimes you know, you had to you breathe all that hypertonic saline, 
you breathing all that uh, aerosol, we draining you, but it's still so thick that it's not coming out. All right. If that's the case, we have to help it along with a little bit of percussion. All right. Whether we're using our hands or a device for it. Okay. What are the indications? What's the first indication of percussion? When it's difficult to mobilize them secretions. Like we could, we did all this draining, we did all this uh, medicine, we're doing all this other stuff. It just won't come out. So now we're going to have to beat it out. All right. Remember on color purple, what I'm going to do with Sophia? What do you say? Beat her. Beat her. <laughs> we have to beat it out. Y'all know color purple? Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> See y'all. You ain't never seen that? Oh, okay. That's understandable. That's understandable. I'm just saying that just came to my mind when I said you got to beat it out. All right. Uh, what's number two indication? Okay. So when you got them draining and it ain't working, let's help it alone, right? But there's some relative contraindications of percussion, which is almost the same as drainage. Empyema. If I'm beating on that pus and stuff, it can spread, right? Flail chest. If they got two or more broke ribs, am I going to be beating all on? No. What about wounds? I'm not going to hit over wounds, right? Something a little bit different in this one is frank homoptosis. What is that? What does frank homoptosis mean? Anybody know what frank homoptosis means? Is Kind of, but not inflammation. It's blood. Frank is frank hypnosis is coughing up bright red blood. Oh, hypnosis is when you coughing up blood. Frank hypnosis is like it's like super red. I mean, just fresh. Something just ruptured, and that's really bright red blood. Because you know, dark colored blood is might be some old blood from an intestinal yeah. issue you got. Uh, but frank means bright red. There's something going on. You have you have ruptured something, right? So if they already coughing up blood. Don't hit on them, okay? Don't don't hit on them. What if they're on anticoagulant therapy? That's a contraindication of percussion. What is anticoagulant therapy? Not clot. So a blood thinner, right? Blood Hepar yeah. heparin. Yeah, yeah, blood thinner. So if they have a, if somebody's on blood thinners, then when you hit them, they easily what? Bleed or bruise. bruise. Rules and bleed. You might make some internal bleeding going on because it's so the blood is so thin, right? It's so thin that, and then especially if it's a Caucasian patient, you might they might think you're beating on them, right? Because they all bruised up real bad. Okay, they bruised up real My bad. My mom's on blood thinners and she bruises and bleeds very easily. Yep. So somebody on anticoagulant therapy like that, you wouldn't do percussion. Okay. Uh, simply pain or intolerance. If somebody just can't take the pain, right? Some other reason they're hurting so bad, they just can't take it, all right? And tuberculosis, TB. You definitely don't want to beat on that because tuberculosis is an airborne disease. All you have to do is breathe that and you got it, okay? And so if they have TB, they're already in airborne isolation, negative pressure room. You got to have the N95 and all of the gown and all that to go in there. But you don't want to be beating on tuberculosis in the lung and spreading it and making it come on out, okay? Making it more and more airborne. And then metastasize cancer. If somebody has cancer, breast cancer, and it's spreading to the shoulder and all that, you don't want to be beating on that because it's just going to spread the cancer, okay? Spread the cancer around, okay? All right, so those are the contraindications of percussion. So make sure you know them because you might have a question. Say all of the all of these are relative contraindications of percussion therapy, except, right? You need to know them. So what is the technique? I just told you about the technique. Uh, you have to have your little cupped hands that make a cup shape, right? And like I said, you have we have other percussion devices, airway clearance devices that we use uh, instead of. Our hands. If you don't want to beat on with your hands, we have all the little things that we can do with them. But it's just like a, a, a ambu bag. You know the bag where we breathe on a patient? You can take that mask, put a little tape on the end, and use it. It makes a cup sound, right? So we have little devices like that. We have 
an actual percussor that's pneumatically powered, right? That plugs up to screws into the uh, air of the flow meter, right? And then you turn it, screw it to the air and cut it on there. Like that, and you just put it on the patient, and it goes back and forth and pops like a jackhammer, right? Like a little jackhammer, like that. We can do that, all right? Uh, but either way it goes, you want to avoid the sternum, number one. Avoid the sternum and any bony, the spine and any, you don't want to be doing it over a bone on somebody's clavicle, right? That'll hurt, right? Or the scapular or their sternum. I think, first of all, it might hurt, but second of all, you ain't doing nothing. Ain't no lung right there, right? Okay? Uh, you may want to use a sheet or a towel to avoid the slapping sound. So when you're going to do it with your hands, you get a little, like a little towel folded up. Okay, Mr. Johnson, turn on, whatever. You're draining them. Then I'm going to take a little sheet, put it over his bare skin, and do my little percussion for my three to five minutes and to keep from hurting or slapping his skin. Okay? All right, because sometimes older people, skin tear is really easy. So you can hit it and it just split open. Just ugh. All right? Make sure you examine the skin when you're done for any effect. Make sure you didn't bruise them, cut them, split the skin, anything like that. And each segment, how long do I hit on it? Three to five minutes. That's the technique for percussion. All right? Now, vibrations are used with percussion. So after I get through beating on you, I'm going to shake as you exhale. So just think of vibrations as when you shake the person when they exhale. Every time he exhale, you shake, right? So that helps because when you exhale, that's when it comes out of the, uh, the segments. They gonna take a deep breath in, you're hitting on them, you're draining them, and then when they, when they exhale, that's what brings that stuff up, right? And there's techniques for uh, exhale. I'm gonna show you some techniques when we get into those devices. Uh, but when you exhale, you have to shake, right? It's kind of funny. It's it may be used in conjunction with percussion or just done alone. If they can't stand percussion, you can just kind of shake them, all right? But how you do it? What's number two say? Yeah. So keeping your arms straight. So if I was shaking a patient, I would keep my arms straight like this, right? Locked, my elbows locked, not, you know, like this, but my elbows will be locked. And I would shake from the shoulders, shake like that when they exhale. So every time I take deep breath and exhale, as soon as he exhales, I'm gonna shake like that. Not like this, but I'm shaking with my shoulders, right? Just a, a shake. And that helps. It's hard, to, it's hard to get it, but you know, once you start doing it, you'll got it. There's no, that's the way, and this ain't the way, you know, it's, it's basically just do the best you can. But try to shake from the shoulders, leaving those arms locked, okay? Uh, Try not to shake them too hard, all right? But that's called vibration. That's when I'm using vibration uh, in order to, because that's what we want. When they exhale, we want to shake, 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 shake. Shake, 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 right? Shake, 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 shake. And now we got devices that do that for us, so we ain't really got to do that. They can blow into a device and it will shake, 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 right? Somebody can't, somebody say, I ain't doing that all day. Let me come up with something. And now they millionaires, okay? Respiratory therapists, okay? All right, <clears throat> number three, indications would be after each segment with percussion. So I, after you percuss on that real good and you're draining them and then tell them take a deep breath and exhale, when they exhale, you would shake, 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 right? That's a whole little three things. You drained them, percussed them, and shook them. Drained them, percussed them, shook them. Drained them, percussed them, shook them, okay? That's the little conjunction that you will use when you're doing your treatments, all right? Hopefully you don't get this because you'll be in a room forever, giving them breathing treatment, and you got to do this, and now they came up with another machine that will shake, 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 will hyperinflate, and give the medicine all at the same time, called the Metanil. Just came out some years ago, uh, but now we're using that a whole lot now, right? So it's just making the job easier and easier for you, okay? But for the NBRC, you need to know how to do it with your own hands if you don't have these machines. Okay, as the therapist. Okay, all right. Then we get into the mechanical percussors and vibrators. All right, the mechanical joints. Now I'm going to show you uh, uh, the PowerPoint for the percussor and the manual devices that we use. Okay, the manual devices that we use. Now I have. I have here 
an acapella. This is an acapella, okay? Also known as a flutter device. This is a flutter device known as the acapella. When a patient exhales through here, there's gonna be a shake. It's a, right? And every time they exhale through here, that back pressure, that shake, shakes my what? My lungs, right? And it helps shake that off. Shake, 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 shake. Shake, 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 shake. And on here, there is a, uh, I don't know if you can see it. There's a dial on here that I can turn that makes it harder or easier, right? There's a little, that little indicator thing right here. And I can turn this to make it harder or easier against pressure, right? I can make it more pressure or less pressure. So when it is either really hard thump or just a little bit, right? Depending on how strong the patient is, okay? But this is a flutter device called the acapella, okay? Acapella. This is just a brand of a flutter device. This is an acapella. And let's see here. Acapella flutter device, and this is the old school flutter device here. This is also a flutter device, which it encompasses a steel ball. There's a steel ball that's supposed to go in, a really heavy little steel ball. And when the patient blows in here, it makes the ball rise and fall. That rising and fall does the same thing as the acapella. Shake, 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 right? Shake, 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 shake. So you got some holes here for your air to come out, and that ball will go up and down, up and down, up and down when you blow through it, okay? This is the original flutter device. This is also a flutter device called the what? Acapella, okay? They both help move secretions, all right? Those are the flutter valves or the flutter devices. Then we have what's called PEP therapy, positive expiratory pressure. Now, if I can either use the flutter mechanism, which, right? Or I can use a constant back pressure. This is called the PEP device. This is a PEP device. See the centimeters of water pressure? I can set that by turning this. I turn this and that red line goes down to whatever pressure I'm trying to set. See that? So I'm on 15. The doctor said I want 15 centimeters of water of positive pressure. And I turn it to 15, right? And then the patient will blow against it. When they blow in it, it doesn't flutter, but it gives back pressure in the lungs. Okay? Let me tell you what happens during PEP device, PEP therapy. When the patient blows into the device, the back pressure goes back into the alveoli and gets behind the secretion, okay? So it hyperinflates that alveoli right quick and the secretions are just stuck in midair, right? And the air gets behind the secretions, that way it can push them up out of the alveoli, okay? That's what's happening on PEP therapy, okay? All this is a part of the right? Yes, we're still talking about airway clearance. We, we're trying to clear the airway, even with the the uh, aerosol, the, the drainage, the percussion, all of that is airway clearance, trying to get the stuff out of the what? Lungs, right? All of it is part of airway clearance, period. We got airway clearance devices we can use, and we have some things we can do with our hands to use. We got medicines we can use, and we have bland aerosols that we've been talking about, right? The humidity and the aerosol, okay? We're just getting into it. We talked about the aerosol and stuff. Then if that don't work, we go to the drainage, right? If the drainage doesn't work or while we're draining, we do the percussion, okay? Also, we would give the patient devices to use. We come in two times a day and make them use their device, right? That's part of the treatment. But on the PEP, I just want to show you, on the PEP device, what's happening is this is the alveoli. Right? If that's the alveoli, and I have green secretions all in there. So say I have secretions in my alveoli. Right? Well, that's causing a problem, right? Let me see that. 
that's causing a problem. Them green secretions right there in my alveoli, right? Well, what I can do is if I use PEP therapy, then I will then force air into my lungs, right? That back pressure will force air into my lungs, okay? That air will get behind the secretions, right? So it will make the alveoli a little bit wider. Let me take this part off. And now, alveoli opens up. And air is now behind what? The secretions. And that will push these secretions back out. So the alveoli gets wider and the uh, air gets behind the green secretions. And then you can huff, huff, huff that stuff out of there. It's called a huff cough. Okay? That's a huff cough. Huff cough. So that's what PEP does. This right here. PEP therapy. You blow it, it's just one little back pressure that you feel. There's no flutter, there's no shake, none of that. The PEP, it's just simple. You blow it like you're blowing into a small straw. If you take a coffee straw and blow hard into it, you're going to get back pressure in your lungs. That's all this is doing. Same thing. Okay? Same thing. Positive expiratory pressure. So when you expire, it's giving you some positive pressure back into your lungs. Okay? You can control this at different centimeters of water. Whatever you tell the doctor's orders, that's what you do. If it's too much, you back up off of it some, right? So I, I can do this too, huh? I have a quick question. Is that almost the same method as purse lips for COPD patients? Yes, purse lip breathing is the same thing. Okay. When they when they force their lips to be smaller and they blow against that, that pops those lungs back open behind the secretions. Okay. So this and this right here would help us do that same thing, but at different pressures. Okay. Uh, and so that's the PEP device, all right? It's like a way to control the pressure, right? Yes, you can control the pressure. Whatever pressure that doctor orders, you can dial it in through here, okay? By turning this little device here, and that red line will tell me how much pressure I got. This is six. This looks like, what, 10, 11, 12, 13, whatever the centimeter of water that doctor orders. It's usually 10 to 15 to start but you can adjust that for the patient's comfort. If he can't do 15, come down off of it, okay? Because you're not, you're not getting anything done if you can't do it, okay? So you can't be overzealous. If you can't do it, you can't do it, all right? So let's look at those on the PowerPoint. Almost done. Like I said, I want to get a lot done because it's, it's a lot to this. Y'all been getting uh, spoiled. Getting out or early. You ain't got at it once since you've been here. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying, y'all haven't got out since I don't want y'all to feel like, dang, he's going on and on. Oh, no. Okay, I got to get this in. Okay. All right, hold on. Where is my. Oh, here it is. Okay. I got to be in a man about a horse at one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here goes the uh, PowerPoint here for pulmonary clearance devices, okay? So this gives you a good, you can always go back and look at this anytime you want to. All right, can y'all see it? All right, airway, pulmonary airway clearance devices. These are some of the devices I just talked about in trying to clear these airways. The PEP device, that's the one I just showed you that gives you that positive pressure, right? The PEP device, this one here, it's blurry. Sometimes it does, I hate when it does that. Close some other applications and see if that helps. Still really, really, really blurry. Okay. Pelt therapy. 
application of positive pressure, usually 10 to 15, that's usually what we start with, 10 to 15 centimeters of water during exhalation. The patient inspires a large a volume greater than tidal volume, right? Just take a deep breath in and they exhale to FRC. You're not forcing, okay? Because if I'm forcing, I'm doing vital capacity, right? Just to FRC. Don't, don't try to, don't try to, I mean, you do it to FRC member is uh, just a normal exhalation after a, uh, uh, a quiet in and quiet out, what's left is FRC. So you just take a deep breath in and blow out normal, okay? To FRC. You're doing 10 to 20 breaths followed by three what? Huff cough. This is a huff cough. Like that. Because if you cough too hard, you push the secretions back down into the alveoli, okay? If I get that good old positive pressure in there and I got the uh, I have now have the air behind the secretions, but then I tell them to <coughs> cough real hard like that, it has forced that secretions back into the alveoli. You have to first puff them up toward the larger airways, and then you cough hard, right? When you cough hard, that is just the stuff in the large airways that you're coughing up. You can't feel the stuff in your alveoli. You have to use the device. It gets the pressure behind the secretions, and then you puff. Like that, puff cough, right? That will push that stuff up out of the alveoli into the larger airways, and then I can do what? Cough it out, right? Then you can cough it out. So that's important. Technique is very important because they can get all that stuff good and up, and then you let them cough, you're doing it wrong, and then they're not benefiting, right? You're doing therapy to them for them to benefit, okay? So 10 to 20 breaths through that PEP device, followed by three huff coughs. You do that five to 10 times per session, okay? Do all that about five to 10 times and you're done with that patient, okay? It can be used simultaneously with a nebulizer treatment because now we have devices where I can put a breathing treatment in line with that, okay? So you inhale and you exhale through pressure. So not only am I popping the lungs open, but I'm also getting nebulizer treatment every time I inhale, okay? I can put it in line. You can put a breathing treatment in line, okay? A breathing treatment in line with that. So like a small... Small volume nebulizer, I showed you. Wherever it is. Oh, this right here. Yeah. The small volume nebulizer with the right attachment, guys, uh, can be placed in between here. So I can put uh, my device like that. See that? See that? So not only am I taking breath in, but I'm blowing against the pressure. Okay? So I'm getting my breathing treatment. And when I exhale, I'm blowing against a pressure. Okay? So I'm popping my lungs open and getting medicine. Popping my lungs open and getting medicine. Okay? So it, that's what they mean by it. it can be used in conjunction with a breathing treatment. All right? We have a machine now that does this called the MetaNet. Right? So it's already made, okay? But if you didn't have that, you could do it yourself, okay? All right. Yeah. All right. Indications to aid in the removal of retained secretions, atelectasis, and routine treatment of cystic fibrosis. You have patients who have cystic fibrosis. I think that's one of the that's what it was. Cystic fibrosis is a terrible genetic disease, okay, that happens in usually uh, Caucasian children, okay? Uh, it's a terrible disease, and they have terrible um, outcomes, okay? They're getting better. They're living longer, but the, it's, it's a bad thing. You'll learn it when we get to those uh, obstructive diseases. Hazards, risk of barrel trauma, and hemodynamic compromise, guys. Barrel trauma is when you stretch the lungs too much, okay? When you damage the lung, that's barrel trauma, right? Doing it too hard or something, kind of pull a muscle in the lung or something like that, that's barrel trauma. And hemodynamic compromise. Hemodynamics is the pressure of the blood through the body. Pressure at the blood in the heart, the pressure in the blood pressure, all that kind of stuff is hemodynamics, all right? And so now when every time you add pressure, positive pressure to the body, you decrease the venous return. Remember I talked about that? 
adding pressure to the body will stop some of the blood from getting back to the heart, which will in turn have a lower blood pressure. Okay, so you have to be careful if they're hemodynamically compromised. All right, because anytime you add, because this positive pressure here, when I blow into it, it's putting positive pressure into my lungs. Anytime you add positive pressure to the lungs, you can decrease the venous return. Remember I said it's like stepping on the heart. Positive pressure, like stepping on the heart. If I'm stepping on the heart, and the blood that's coming back through the superior and inferior vena cava can't get into the heart, right? And if it can't get into the heart, it can't come out on the other side. And the blood pressure is on the other side. So if you decrease the venous return, then you're going to decrease the cardiac output, okay? If I decrease the venous return, then I'm going to decrease the cardiac output by default, okay? Because if it can't get in, it can't get out. So hemodynamics, which you will learn later in RT240, uh, I think, when you get to 240, they talk about hemodynamics, okay? But that's PEP, positive expiratory pressure. Flutter valve. The flutter valve was the first one I showed you, the little white one. It's similar to PEP. It has a weighted ball that rises and falls with each breath. This action opens and closes a little valve inside of there uh, and alternating and opening and closing of this valve causes your lungs to shake. Might as well say it causes those pulses to be transmitted to the lung parenchyma or the alveolar heart, right? So that's the shaking, shaking, shaking. You blow into the flutter valve and it's shaking, shaking, shaking. That little ball that's inside it rises and falls, okay? Indications are the same as PEP, hazards are the same as PEP. Same stuff, just a different way. All right? Now, High frequency chest wall oscillation. That's the chest vest. This is a pneumatically inflatable vest that connects to an air pulse generator. It fills up around your chest like a vest, like a bulletproof vest you put on. You hook it up and it fills up with air. When I turn it on, it's going to shake your whole body. Just like that. Okay? But faster. Right, you're trying to, it's shaking the whole body and that's shaking all of the stuff off all of the segment. All right, what is happening is rapidly inflates and deflates the vest 10 to 20 times per second. All right, this is another thing we use for cystic babies because it's so much. They got the cystic fibrosis patient gonna have a thousand different medicines they take every day. They got two or three different devices they have to use every day just to get that stuff out of their lungs. It fills up with pus secretions. The secretions are not mucus, it's pus. That's terrible. It stinks, smells bad, it means nasty. It's just, a, it's just a terrible disease. It really is. All right? See that? Mucus is indications. Mucus plug and that pus and mucus just gets all sticky and stuck. And it retains secretion. Treatment of cystic fibrosis. Hazards may be unable, uh, unstable chest fracture. So if you got some broken ribs, it might crack and puncture your lungs. So you can't use because it's going to squeeze your chest. Right? It squeezes your chest and shake you like this. Okay? So this is the chest bed. This is the chest bed. I'm going to demonstrate. Volunteer? All right, this is the chest there. You can sit down in this chair. Be careful because it's smooth. All right, this is the chest vest. Wraps up like a bulletproof vest. There you go. Tap on to her like this, and this one right your way. Yeah, nice and smooth. And these will be like that. Got these uh, tips and got those two little tubings on there. See them tubing? Okay. Now, they got an old school, but we have a new one now. This is what it looks like. Okay, the heel ROM, uh, high frequency chest wall oscillator. Okay, and so I'm going to hook this up. I'm going to have this on the floor so you won't see it, but you'll see her. 
All right, you have two large tubings that will go from the machine to her vest. I'll let you put these on your vest. Just stick them up on there, real good. All right. Then the others will go in here, on here. And the other one goes in the other side. I don't think it matters which one goes where. All right, now to plug it up. Turn it on. Now I turn it on, it's going to start to inflate. Notice how this is inflating now. Feel it? Yeah. <laughs> All right, I got it set at 19 hertz. All right, and then you can set the timing, you can set the uh, the pressure and the uh, how long it lasts, okay? Now I'm gonna start. When I press the start button, she's gonna start to shake. You tell me when to stop, I need to stop. Yeah. How does that feel? <laughs> <laughs> so that is the high frequency chest wall oscillator. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I need one of these in the house for no reason. <laughs> and so that's what we use on our cystic fibrosis patients, our people who have a whole lot of secretions who can't get them off. If these devices don't work, we can use the chest thing. I turn it off and it will start to deflate. So pull them off of there. And that's it. Okay. Okay. It made my nose feel funny. <laughs> Of all the things, it makes your nose feel funny. <laughs> all right. So that is the high-frequency high, uh, high frequency chest wall oscillator. It will be labeled uh, like that, H-L-C-H-W, something like that. Whatever high-frequency chest wall oscillation stands for that. All right? That's how you would see that. And a test question, you might see high frequency or you might see the H, F, C, W, O. That's what that is. We'll just put it right there. I'll put it up in a minute. I'll give you $5 if you make one of the test questions. Say it made my nose feel funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool, wouldn't it? <laughs> I'd All take right. it $5. <laughs> so that's the chat, the, uh, chest wall oscillator okay this is the flutter device i was talking about type one which is that one that has that ball in there okay flutter device type one and this is the flutter device type two known as the acapella acapella the type one shows that metal ball this is that metal ball right here that i was talking about right here and as you blow into it that rock the ball rises and falls and this uh trap closes opens and closes and that puts back pressure in your lungs like a, prrr, a fluttering back into your lungs okay this is the pep device that i just showed you right i showed you the pep when you blow into it against a set pressure called threshold pep right threshold you just 
turn this device up here to whatever pressure you need to set. Remember, we set it at 10 to 15 centimeters of water. They do it 10 to 20 times per session, followed by three what? Huff coughs. That huff is what gets it up out of your alveoli. Okay. This is just here saying what is PEP. It's just what I just talked about. It's not really just another slide I put in here. Uh, talks about bronchial hygiene. You can go back and look at that. All right, patient positioning. This is some of the patient positionings here. This is prone, right? This is what? Supine. This is when a right lateral recumbent. So you're laying on your right side. This is left lateral recumbent when you're laying on your left side, okay? This is Fowler's, and this is what? Trendelenburg. When the head is lower than the feet, that is called Trendelenburg. Whenever you have the head be above the feet, that's reverse Trendelenburg, okay? They don't have that on, but the reverse Trendelenburg will be when the head is up and the feet are down, okay? All right. Those some of the positions. You can go back and look at those as well. This is some, also some postural drainage position. So you can look at these, study these, talk about the anterior segments, uh, the upper lobes, apical segments, how you would position them and kind of how your picture of the lungs. See, this, this is the lungs here. This will be the posterior, I mean the posterior one. This will be the uh, uh, anterior one, right? Uh, then you have your right and left. Let's see, posterior segments, the left and the right, how you turn them. See how he has him, like I told you, when the pillow was in my face, I'm laying on the bed, but the bed is cocked up 30 degrees, and I'm on my supine, right? That's what I was talking about. Uh, here goes that lingual where the head of the bed is down, but that left side is cocked up just a little bit, right? Just a little bit. And then this is on the right side, where the, the, I'm, I'm still head of the bed down, I'm, I'm supine, but my right side is cocked up a little bit. See how that's cocked up a little bit? Just one fourth turn from supine. That's what that means. So you can look at those. This is another one. So I got pl plenty of pictures about this. Now, this, these dots will show you the segment. The stuff is trapped into these particular segments. I got stuff in these segments. If I have stuff in this segment, right, the anterior segments of the lower lobes. Uh, what about if I have my uh, <clears throat> left lingular? Uh, you know, whatever that is, that's how you turn your patient. See that pillow? Sometimes we put a pillow in there. <clears throat> this guy here is on his, uh, he is head of the bed down a little bit or feet of the bed up, you know what I'm saying? And he's on his back, which is supine, but his left side is up just a little bit, right? One fourth turn from supine, okay? Up off the bed, just one fourth a turn from supine. So these are some of your posterior drainage <clears throat> positions to go back and look at from the PowerPoint. Go back and study these, okay? Manual percussor, this is that one I told you, like a jackhammer. Plug it up and it da -da 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 like that. You can hold that if you don't wanna use your hands. You can use the manual percussor. Some of them are electrical power, some of them are pneumatically powered. The ones we have in the hospitals that you see the most are pneumatically powered ones. They hook up to the air, okay? <clears throat> This is a vibrator here. You hit the button and it vibrates real hard, okay? It's almost like a massager, okay? But it vibrates real, and sometimes it's so strong it'll vibrate, you can't even hold it. It's hard to hold it because your hand gets feeling funny and numb, right? Here's the uh, hand position for percussion. This is how you should look when you're percussing someone. This patient is laying on their left side, getting her right side percussed on. This is how it should look, right? Hand is cupped, making a cupping sound, not a slapping sound, okay? This is the chest vest. Well, I just showed you the chest, uh, high frequency chest wall oscillator. You will see it like this, HFCWO. That's what that means, high flow chest wall oscillation. You got the machine and you got the vest. Usually used in our children who have cystic fibrosis cystic fibrosis patients. All right, that might be it. That's it. That's it on that uh, PowerPoint. So you you got all those, that PowerPoint has all of the um, 
all of the um, clearance devices, whether it's flutters, pelts, percussion, drainage positions, and the chest vest. All of that is there for you to watch and go back and look at. All right, all that's for you to go back and look at. Let me make sure that's all of the lesson plan because I'm going to probably, what's tomorrow? Is tomorrow the lab? I think tomorrow, is it? Let me look at the, the syllabus. I don't think it's tomorrow. We have lab and our exam Thursday. Thursday, so tomorrow is what? Wednesday? Wednesday. Okay. All right, so let me see where we are in the PowerPoint. I mean, not the PowerPoint, but the uh, actual lesson plan, and then we're going to stop. So I know what I what I'm hitting on tomorrow. All right, lesson plan. Let's see where we at. Lesson plan. All right. <clears throat> so I just showed you mechanical, mechanical percussors and vibrators. What's after that? Pep therapy. We just talked about that. 10 to 12, 20 breaths followed by three huff calls. So we just talked about that, the indications of it, the wrist, it's just the, it's just the devices. Flutter valve, right? Similar to PEP, what's happening in each one of these. You can go back and pause this if you wanna write down for your note taking guide. But this is what I just went over in the PowerPoint. Same stuff, it's just on the PowerPoint, right? But I'm gonna go through it so you can do that. And hazards, of course, of it. And then after that, that's it. That's it. Okay. What about the position? I didn't get the position yet. Okay. The rest of the right what upper lobe? Yeah. Right there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So that is it on the actual uh, material, all the way from aerosol down to the percussion and the devices. So tomorrow will be a pretty much review day of all of this. I'm gonna do some class work. So it would behoove you to be live or be here to work some of the quizzes. They're not for grades, but the quizzes to work on those to make sure you have this. I'm gonna have some quizzes for you, some class work. I may have a couple of cahoots game to do or something like that, but it's a lot. You need to practice those uh, positions, all right? Uh, and understanding uh, which position is what kind of use it without looking at your notes so that you're prepared for the lab and the test on Thursday, okay? So, so, it's, so on the lab, you guys are gonna have to show me the different types of nebulizer, to show me the different types of humidifiers, right? And show me the percussion devices or whatever the airway clearance device I ask. So I may say, okay, I want you, this group to uh, uh, drain the superior segment of the left lower lobe. Right, so you and your partner, or whatever, would turn your patient to do that. Okay, I may say, okay, show me how you would explain a pep therapy to somebody. Right, you would tell them, okay, I want you to take a deep breath in and blow out normal against this force. Right, telling them what is it doing for them. Pep device is getting air behind the what secretions in the alveoli, and then what after they get it, what how they follow by three. Huff calls. That's how you have to be able to explain it. As long as you can explain it, show it, and or notify it, that's a check off. Okay, that's how you get checked off. Make sure you guys work on. We'll, tomorrow we can work on those lab book pages, right? Whatever is due in the lab, we can work on that tomorrow uh, to make sure you got all that. Then you understand uh, those answers to those questions. Okay. Uh, if nobody's in the lab tomorrow, I may even go over there and, and review. Okay, but we got everything here that we need. So it's on you to go and study and take this to heart. Go study it, look at it, look at your book, read it. And then tomorrow is a whole review day. Try to be here if you can, and then you'll be prepared for Thursday. Okay? All right. Good day, and I will see you guys tomorrow morning.